this week's live Q&A. Um, I'll probably be missing next week's live Q&A, um, unless I'm able to film it beforehand because I'll be traveling. But uh, maybe I'll be able to find some time to do it. So um, I completed, just to give everyone an update, um, I was doing this on Twitter, but then I kind of got sick of using Twitter <laughs> for the last week or so. I haven't really been updating my Twitter feed. Uh, but I completed 30 days of a carnivore reset, and where I was actually, it was more of a lion diet where I was only eating red meat, salt, and drinking water, and uh, having bone broth as well, and some organ meats, you know, from the from the ruminant animals. Um, it took me a little while to get completely fully adjusted to it. My uh, I was constipated there for about a week in the probably the third week of of it, and then just in the last few days, probably day twenty five through thirty, I um, started having normal bowel movements. Um, and uh, but yeah, and, and also for a few days, I ended up feeling quite tired, and I thought it was something to do with the diet, but Basically, I just took a few days off from doing my normal morning walks, and then I felt fantastic. <laughs> so I guess I was just kind of a bit run down, and maybe it was partly switching over from using carb metabolism to to protein and fat metabolism. Um, but it just all, all I needed to do was basically take a break for a few days, and then you know when I came back to walking, I walked like twenty thousand steps the first day, which is more than I I usually walk. Actually, I usually walk ten to fifteen thousand. Um, so yeah, I think I'll probably try some sprints again, maybe today or tomorrow and see how those go. And, but overall feeling great. I mean, my sleep has gotten better. Um, I think some subtle improvements in just motivation. I think I noticed that since the first few days actually, but, um, you know, it's, it's subtle and it's hard to explain, but like when you're under a lot of stress, it's like, you just like there's you don't have enough mental space or enough um ability to multitask or take on additional things right so okay i i know i have enough energy and mental capacity and space in my brain and just like i can deal with my work i can deal with my job but if there's anything outside of that, you know, the, this narrow set of tasks that I've assigned myself, I just don't want to do it, anything else, right? And I, I actually had been feeling like that. I hadn't really realized it, but I've been feeling like that for a long time. And that feeling is like lifted. So I think a lot of inflammation is clearing up. And just to clarify for people, I don't plan on being carnivore for the rest of my life, but I do think that it's a great elimination diet and a great reset. And uh, I do think that most people with chronic inflammatory issues, uh, you know, I was pretty overweight. I lost 20 pounds during those 30 days. I actually lost almost 23, but then I gained back a few maybe in water weight or whatever, but I kind of stabilized around 20 pounds lost and about three and a half to four inches down on my waist size, which is pretty significant. You know, it looks a lot different. Um, and uh, so, yeah, when you, when you have this kind of chronic, you're, you're a little bit overweight and um, have chronic inflammation from probably visceral fat, uh, you usually have gut dysfunction and leaky gut. And, and it's difficult sometimes to solve that without doing a strict elimination diet. And in many cases, all the way down to just animal foods. Because I can tell when I eat certain things, I just feel weird. I feel a little bit strange. Um, it's subtle. I mean, it's not terrible. I, I don't have like severe chemical sensitivity syndrome or anything like that, or severe food intolerances that I can tell. But I do ha like I'll eat something and I just like feel a little bit of reflux or a little lump in my throat or my bowels feel a little bit off or, you know, th these subtle things. So I think for some people, it's a very useful um, tool. Um, so anyway, let's get to the questions. Carol Winnig says, have you heard any of any incidences of pinpoint gastric ulcers when taking natokinase? I have not, no. I, I've actually looked into this a little bit and uh, discovered that somehow natokinase um, improves blood flow to the gut. And so you wouldn't expect to see gastric ulcers with natokinase. 
Um, you know, there's always going to be idiosyncratic reactions where somebody reports that they developed gastric ulcers, whether that was from natokinase or something else that they did or didn't do or whatever. You know, it's hard to tell unless you read the entire case report or get a case report on them. Um, one thing that I came across recently, you know, of adding potassium supplement, um, sometimes, you know, certain supplements, if you take them without mixing them with food, they can cause gastric ulcers. If they clump into a little spot in your stomach, then that can cause gastric ulcers. So, you know, most people who are taking out a kinase are taking a lot of other supplements. Maybe they were taking a potassium supplement, maybe they're taking some other supplement. And and regardless, even if it was natokinase that did it, I mean, if, if something clumps up, um, and, and you are supposed to take natokinase ideally without food. So um, maybe the best way to take it would be to mix it up with water so it doesn't clump into a little spot in your gut. Um, and uh, possibly another beneficial, you know, thing that you could do with natokinase is to put it into a capsule that uh, passes through the stomach. So a capsule that doesn't dissolve in the gastric juices so that you skip the stomach anyway. Um, so yeah, I mean, that seems to be helpful if there's something that's not supposed to be taken with food to put it into a capsule that, that can skip the stomach so that you don't end up having clumps of uh, any substance clumping together in a little spot in your stomach. James Smith says, any suggestions for recovering from COVID 2.0? I'm taking hydroxychloroquine and have been tested negative since Saturday. Yeah, so I think the keys for COVID, if you get to it in the first couple of days, very high dose vitamin C, oral or IV or both. Uh, and by very high dose, I mean 30 to 60 grams, not milligrams, but grams. Uh, I like to take a sorbyl palmitate powder mixed with water um, because it mixes well. It doesn't have any bad taste at all uh, versus the other forms. And it also doesn't have too much of like magnesium, calcium, or some other thing that you don't want to get that much of. Um, and it's not super sour the way ascorbic acid is. Um, you can also take uh, IP6 gold from iherb.com, uh, one and a half scoops every four hours until you feel better. Um, and then uh, hydroxychloroquine, yeah, you take that 200 milligrams twice a day for at least five days. If you're still feeling sick on day seven or eight, then one way that seems to be really well proven for preventing long COVID is to take a Medrol dose pack or some other, you know, steroid pack for four or five days, taper off of it, and that that prevents long COVID inflammation that develops starting in the second week. Um, so depending on how, so Saturday, so that's four days ago. Um, so you're probably. I, either you're in the first week or you're in the second week. I, I don't know. <laughs> All I know is that it's four days since you tested negative. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what to tell you. Um, you know, you can take a month or so off from exercise. That's another great thing, at least from cardio exercise. Uh, you want to give yourself a break during that window where you might be developing inflammation so that you don't worsen the inflammation and trigger long COVID. The, the other thing that really helps to recover starting in the second week is low carb or no carb. So, so low carb, avoid all processed foods, no sugars, no grains, no like an anti-inflammatory diet, which would eliminate grains, dairy, uh, eggs, uh, so grains, dairy, eggs, um, sugars, uh, other refined carbs, any kind of sugar, and um, nightshade vegetables and high oxalate containing plants. Uh, so eliminate all those and even then go low carb, uh, mostly fat and protein, and that'll help you speed up the recovery dramatically. But at least don't go and have like birthday cake or, you know, cupcakes or and junk food at all. Avoid seed oils regardless. I mean, you should always be avoiding seed oils. Um, so olive oil is fine, but avoid all the other almost all the other vegetable seed oils. So, you know, coconut oil is okay. Um, olive oil is good. Um, most of the other stuff that's on the shelf, like canola oil, all that stuff, you know, it's just junk food and it's really, really bad for you. And it takes you a couple of years to get it completely out of your body and eliminate all the inflammation that it causes. Um, the other thing that is, you know, an interesting point here, along with the seed oils, um, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids and very prone to damage oxidation 
both outside your body and inside your body. Similar to those seed oils, the, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, these are also polyunsaturated fatty acids, are the omega th omega threes and omega sixes. Um, so you know, canola oil has a lot of omega three. That's one of the reasons that it's considered to be you know good for you, although it's likely not good for you at all. Um, but yeah, fish oils also have the same inherent kind of like drawbacks and. I would actually recommend people Google Chris Kresser um, omega-3. Let me see what the exact, uh, maybe it's Chris Kresser fish oil or something. Um, should you really be taking fish oil? Question mark by Chris Kresser. And you'll find a, uh, if you just Google Chris Kresser, should you really be taking fish oil? It'll pop up an article. Um, yeah, I think that's the the last update was in 2019. This is the one that I read. It's really, really eye-opening. So fish oils, and Chris Masterjohn has also written and talked about this and spoken about it on social media and on uh, YouTube. So Chris Masterjohn and Chris Kresser, they both uh, put together great work on um, fish oil supplementation. And the upshot is that these fish oils have some anti-inflammatory benefits in the short term, but in the long term, they oftentimes are pro-inflammatory actually. And the studies on fish oils were done for less than a year, most almost all of them. A couple of studies were done for like multiple years and they actually showed harms from fish oils. Um, if you're gonna, consume fish oil, it has to be of the utmost quality, highest quality possible. Myself and a lot of other people have become convinced that Rosita Naturals is the best quality on the market for cod liver oil. And that the main reason to take the fish oil is not for the omega-3s, but for the fat soluble vitamins in the fish oil, the vitamin A, D, you know, all that stuff, vitamin E is required as well. And these polyunsaturated fatty acids in their natural form, like in the fish, for example, you know, so the, the omega threes are usually wrapped up inside of a fish and and not separated out as an oil. In their natural form, there's vitamin E and other antioxidants that are preventing them from becoming damaged. You eat them and those antioxidants, you eat them with the antioxidants, which help to prevent um, further damage in your own body. So uh, having these polyunsaturated fatty acids in your body raises your requirement for vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, which helps to um, minimize the harm from them, but doesn't completely eliminate the harm that happens longer term. So longer term um, fish oil use seems to increase the risk of heart disease and, and other serious chronic inflammatory diseases. So I know a lot of people are taking like really high doses and I've recommended myself, the FLCCC recommended it, you know, up to four grams of fish oil a day or Vascipa, which is EPA only. Um, I think that that recommendation should probably be revised and it may not be safe. And based on my reading of the literature out there, I would not do it myself and I wouldn't recommend people do it. I would recommend just eating fatty fish two or three times a week, you know, and getting your fish oil from the fish itself, maybe supplementing a little bit of fish oil, but not four grams of fish oil of omega threes a day. Uh, so I've updated my own recommendations on, uh, at my doc.com with that for the long COVID protocol. Um, all right. So Susie Steele says with long COVID, but uh, sorry to go back. <laughs> I usually jump ahead a little bit. So James Smith's question, um, you know, every time you get a COVID infection, you're going to be, anytime you get a, any serious infection at all, um, you can burn through a lot of micronutrients and you know deplete your own body's levels so maybe taking a month or two of um, immunity of vitamins from my go-to stack uh, and you can consider taking like a whole protocol you can add the detox supplement with natokinase syrup peptase which is going to be relaunching soon with bromelain added um, and the reason there so we've taken out the augmented nac and put in bromelain because um that, you know, Dr. Peter McCullough, for one, recommends that a base spike detox protocol, which he published a paper on, consisting of natokinase, bromelain, and curcumin. Now, the natokinase and the bromelain as enzymes are supposed to be taken on an empty stomach, so they go in one supplement. That's going to be our detox supplement. And then the curcumin should be taken with a meal. That is in a different supplement. It's the immunity herbal supplement, which comprises curcumin, nigella sativa, and dandelion. And they're, they're all synergistic. They all work very well together. So I put those all together. So you get kind of 
Dr. McCullough's base spike detox plus, right? Like an upgraded synerg version of that with some other synergistic ingredients. So along with the natto and seropeptase, or sorry, natto and, and bromelain, which he recommends, we have the seropeptase, EGCG, folic acid, humic acid from um, the, um, what is that called? Um, from Shilajit. And, uh, and we'll probably be launching a separate NAC supplement, um, which will pr hopefully be a lot cheaper than augmented NAC, but you just have to take a higher dose of it. So I would, for the starting dose would probably be like a thousand milligrams and you can go up as needed to, you know, two, three, 4,000 milligrams, uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram per day is the uh, recommendation for regular NAC. Um, so you might even go up to 5,000 milligrams a day of the NAC, but you could put it in divided doses. Uh, so taking like the immunity vitamins and hopefully we'll eventually be launching an immunity multi-balance supplement, um, which is meant to balance out the immunity vitamins and also kind of be a multivitamin. But, you know, because people taking just the immunity vitamins, which a lot of people have been taking from the beginning of the pandemic, and they've been taking vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, you know, and quercetin. Well, you need other vitamins to balance out those, especially if you're taking these chronically for a long period for long periods of time. The vitamin D should be balanced out with other fat soluble vitamins. So we had space to add vitamin K2 into the immunity vitamins themselves, but we didn't have space for vitamin A or vitamin E. So those are important balancing vitamins for the D and the K2. And then for the zinc, the very important balancing vitamin is, is uh, copper. Um, so you can develop uh, deficiencies of some of those vitamins that need to be ba balanced when you overdo the, you know, particular vitamins. Uh, so, you know, a multivitamin supplement, a mineral supplement, you know, for a month or two to help just top up levels that might've gotten low nutrient dense diet after you come off of the, uh, low carb or no carb for a month or two, um, go back to, uh, a nutrient dense diet that avoids processed foods and seed oils. Um, all right. So those I think are the main things and then get really good sleep, focus on your sleep, relax a lot, try to avoid undue stress. If you are under a lot of stress from work, then you have to have a plan to manage stress. Um, a great way to manage stress, which may not be available <laughs> during the COVID recovery period is exercise. Um, once you've fully recovered and you're out of the woods, you know, in that first month, four to six weeks, then sprinting is a fantastic way or any sort of maximal effort, like high intensity interval type of training. If you're, if you feel stressed out, pump out like 20 push ups or, you know, 50 air squats or whatever, you know, just like, you know, something or jumping jacks or running in place really fast or something that uses as much, as many muscles as possible, but probably running in place would be the best one. Um, you know, and just blast it for like 15 seconds or so. And and then, you know, that's that's a great solution for stress. But in this, you know, COVID recovery period, I would avoid cardio like that, the high intensity cardio. Um, but, you know, get plenty of sunlight, spend as much time outdoors as possible. Spend, you know, if, you know, I think ideally you build in four or five time slots during the day that are five minutes each. One, when you wake up where you just do breath work, you relax, you do some stretching, meditation, whatever you want to do, prayer, whatever it is. And then one around midday, right? Maybe linked to the time that you eat lunch or whatever, but like it should be on your schedule. Another five minutes where you just relax, reset, you know, recenter yourself, refocus, calm down, take a tiny little five minute break from your life. And then maybe somewhere mid afternoon, maybe around sunset, again and maybe before you go to bed so four or five times a day you set these little five minute periods on your schedule where you have to like disconnect from all your work go somewhere else like move yourself physically away from the workstation go sit down on a couch or sit down on the floor or whatever right sit down on your desk sit down in your car wherever sit down in a closet if you have to but like separate yourself from the stressful situation recenter you know recover and uh, when you do that you'll find that your sleep improves and just your whole life improves so um that's really important for managing stress like how do you manage stress you have to take those little moments out of your day sit there center yourself do some breath work whatever you want to do right it can be anything you want you can just sit there and relax you can sit there one of those periods can just be a nap you can lie down for 15 minutes uh, maybe midday or right after lunch or whatever a power nap that's great 
um, you can just do like deep rest where you sit there and just like, you can just notice your breathing, right? Or you can just like notice sounds around you, or you can notice your heartbeat or whatever, right? There's different forms of very simple meditations and just focusing exercises that you can do that have no religious overtones or connotations. Um, it's a great time to do breath work. So a great time to do buteco breathing, great time to do belly breathing, great time to do just nasal breathing, you know, five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out, five and a half seconds in, five and a half seconds out. Great time to do the three, seven, eight, uh, breathing, um, where you breathe in for three seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, breathe out through pursed lips for eight seconds. Um, you should only do that for like, you know, three, four times. Um, you're not supposed to do that continuously for a long time. Uh, but that's a great kind of like kick off to that, you know, relaxation session. Um, it's a good time to do, you can do box breathing where you breathe in for like, you know, breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds. Um, hold your breath for four seconds, then, you know, repeat the cycle. So there, just look up breath work and breathing exercises, uh, pranayama yoga, different kinds of breathing exercises, uh, buteco breathing, uh, bu the buteco clinic on YouTube has some great exercises. Um, so it's a great time to just cycle through a few of those, maybe do some stretching, you know, whatever, something that relaxes you. Uh, okay, so I guess that's enough of an answer. Um, you just have to give yourself some space to recover. That's the main thing. And not trigger a worsening due to piling yourself up with too much stress. Susie, and stress can be from lack of sleep. It can be from you know work. It can be from too much exercise in that situation, like overdoing the exercise for that time period of you know COVID recovery. It can be due to you know um, tension with your co-workers or tension with your spouse or family members or friends um, and again some of the stress you can't eliminate so you have to manage it by doing these you know have a structured um, structured periods throughout your day to recover from the stress that's um, acting on you uh, stress can be from food stress can be from negative thoughts uh, fear anger um, negative all other negative emotions and they're you know, other things I would encourage a gratitude practice during those five minute sessions during the day um, where you just take a few seconds out to like feel intense gratitude for all the things that you have in your life that are good, all things that are going right for you and focus on the glass half full side of things. And, um, you know, if you have trouble, just keep thinking about all of, you know, until you can list a lot of things that you feel deeply grateful for. Um, all right, so, and then imagine yourself feeling better. You can also use your imagination during this time. So imagine yourself like fully recovered back to all your activities, back to your usual exercise routine, looking great, feeling great, you know, whatever you would be doing after this period of recovery and, uh, and feel grateful during that imagination period when you're imagining it in as much detail as possible. All right, Susie says, would long COVID make one more chemically sensitive, especially post mold exposure? How would we protect our blood brain barrier from toxins if we're sensitive and have pain associated with toxins? So the first step is minimizing toxins, um, at least from a functional medicine perspective, minimizing toxic exposure. So for mold, um, get a uh, air purifier for wherever you are, maybe one for your job, one for your home, you know, for different rooms in your home have um, maybe like IQ air or one of these other ones that destroys the mold toxins, the mold spores in the air, as well as filtering out the air. Um, but yeah, it can make some people sensitive for sure. Um, and so not, not most people in my experience, but some people definitely end up with mold problems after long COVID. Um, the other line of defense is to eliminate them from your own body. So I think plasma donation is the best way to do that for any toxins that have built up in your body, including mold toxins and, and even the, the antibodies that like autoantibodies that are a form of toxin for you, right? So your body's creating autoantibodies which attack your own tissues. Those can be removed with like plasma donation. The spike protein can be removed. Microglots can be removed. Heavy metals can be removed. Forever chemicals can be removed. Microplastics can be removed. Everything comes out, right? So just donate plasma as frequently as you can. Um, 
And then there are specific detox um, binder supplements that you can swallow. So things like for the spike protein, natokinase, seropeptis, you know, all that stuff, NAC, um, bromelain, curcumin, and uh, all the other stuff. And then there are like more generic binders for things like heavy metals and plastics and all that stuff. So those would be things like chlorella. And let me see. Um, there's a supplement that I ordered myself that, uh, let me just see if I can pop it up, that has like all the common detox chemicals all in one supplement. Uh, I'm just searching for it. Um, hmm. Some reason I can't find it. Uh, anyway, I mean it has things like chlorella and um, bentonite clay, and here it is, all-in-one detox binder supplement. I think I've spoken about it before. <laughs> Jagiellolia. <laughs> Jagiellolia, J A G I E L O L I A, <laughs> all in one detox binder supplement on Amazon. Um, this one looks good just because it has all the different detox supplements. And chlorella is probably the safest one to take on its own. It doesn't. Um, so let me just uh, paste it in the chat here so uh, people can see it who are. All right. Um, all right. So I'm also going to take a look at the live questions real quick here. Um, but let me just make sure I finished answering this one. Um, yeah. So it would make you more chemically sensitive in some people. Um, how do you protect the blood brain barrier? And so, yeah, it's. Uh, you know, what, what can rebuild these barriers, the gut barrier, the blood brain barrier, the vascular barriers, right? There's barriers between all tissues, right? And so most of these barriers are involved with blood vessels. So the gut will have a barrier which interacts with the blood vessels. So it lets things into blood vessels, some things, it's supposed to let nutrients in and not let other things in. And then the blood brain barrier is the same, right? Like the blood is supposed to let some things in and not other things into the brain. And you have the same with all the tissues. There's a, um, there's a, like a basement membrane, you know, to some degree, a barrier between the blood and other tissues, but uh, not, you know, as exclusive as blood brain barrier and the blood gut barrier. Um, so the, uh, these walls of the blood vessels are, are inflamed and there that's where a lot of the problems are. And that's probably where most of the problem with long COVID and vaccine injury occurs. It's in different vascular beds, different blood vessel areas inside the body. So in different tissues, the blood vessels that feed them have become inflamed and they may not be delivering oxygen properly. They may be full of microclots, all that stuff. So you got to get rid of the microclots, plasma donation, Natokinase, seropeptase, bromelain, et cetera, curcumin, et cetera, um, maybe aspirin, maybe plavix, things like that. Um, and you have to um, also heal the blood vessels. So stem cells are a great way to do that. How do you get stem cells? You use hyperbaric oxygen therapy or you rent an oxygen concentrator for like $50 a month and you breathe pure oxygen, 100% oxygen, one hour twice a day. Do that for four months and then see how you feel. Usually after three to four months, you'll be feeling fantastic and you'll be back to normal. And the so the oxygen, the pure oxygen, either in an oxygen concentrator, just sitting next to your desk with a mask on or a nasal cannula in, like an oxygen bar, but for an hour twice a day, it, with 100% pure oxygen or sitting in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber where the pressure is a little higher, the oxygen goes a little bit deeper, you get a little bit more benefit. Um, also breathing pure oxygen in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber for one hour a day. So you can alternate those on the days you can't go to the hyperbaric, you can just use the oxygen in your home with the oxygen concentrator, uh, but you should do it every day, an hour a day in hyperbaric or two, one hour twice a day with an oxygen concentrator. That pure oxygen stimulates stem cell production in your bone marrow. 
the stem cells leave your bone marrow, they enter your bloodstream, they go and find places that need patching up and they fix those spots. So that I recommend everyone does that as well. Um, one of my patients today was like, yeah, I you, you keep recommending plasma donation <laughs> and I tried searching for it online. And most of the places online where people are talking about it, they're mentioning your name, um, but I couldn't find a single person who said that they tried plasma donation and they got better and then the the improvement stuck with them right so they a lot of them got better but they didn't stay better and i was like well okay you know it's like hyperbaric oxygen you have to do it for four months um it's like trying to get rid of microclots with natokinase and seropeptase you have to do it for like four to six months it doesn't happen after a week of doing natokinase and seropeptase it's the same with plasma donation <laughs> i mean you're not listen plasma is one tissue in your body okay it's carrying all the junk in your body is being carried around in the plasma why is that it's because whatever's anywhere in your body okay it diffuses across different barriers into your blood all right so you've got spike protein say you've got it in your arm and say you've got it in your bone marrow and say you've got it in your liver and you've got it in all these different spots in your body a little bit of it filters out of those organs into your blood where, which is where your plasma is, all right? So plasma is the liquid portion of your blood. So it's carrying some of those toxins, right? Some of the forever chemicals are bound up in your fat tissues and some of them are in your muscles and some of them are here and there, right? All of your body and some of them are in your blood. Once you remove the ones that are in your blood or at least like 30%, 40%, so you take out 40% of the plasma in your blood, take it out, give it away to somebody else, somebody else uses it, right? Or they process it you know, clean it up and give it to somebody else as a plasma product. So that's gone from your body. All the toxins that were in that plasma are also gone from your body. But that's not all the toxins in your body. It's just the toxins that were in that little 800 mLs of plasma, right? So that's not all the toxins in your body, but it's a chunk of them, right? Now that you've removed them from your bloodstream, your blood fills back up with water. You're drinking water, you're eating proteins, your plasma proteins reform your blood in volume inflates again. Now you have more plasma in your blood, right? Now the toxins in the remaining blood get more diluted than they were before, which means that there's more pressure from the other tissues that have the toxins in them to send, to leak out some of their own toxins back into your bloodstream to equalize the distribution of toxins throughout your body, okay? So I don't know, I've tried to explain this briefly before, hopefully this slightly longer explanation makes sense, but uh, if it doesn't, it's basically like, cast your mind back to like chemistry or biology in you know, high school, where you have a compartment, like a box full of water, and you've got like a membrane in the middle of the box that allows water to pass back and forth, and it also allows something like spike protein to pass back and forth through the membrane. Like it doesn't stop the spike protein from going from one side to the other. You drop spike protein in the right side of the tank, it eventually diffuses over to the left side until there's equal amounts on both sides, right? There's equal amounts everywhere. It's all diffused like a gas, you know? So things eventually diffuse on their own. They just start bouncing around until they spread out through the whole tank. So that tank is your body. One side of the tank is like all your organs and muscles and everything. And the other side is your blood. All right. And things are just passing back and forth between them. Right. There's some things that don't pass back and forth easily. There's some things that have to be like actively transported from one side to the other. But spike protein and toxins and all those things, they don't have active transport molecules. <laughs> they just pass back and forth. Right. So if you take out a scoop of water from this side of the tank and throw it away, there will still be equal amounts of spike protein on both sides. They'll just automatically redistribute, especially if you scoop out a you know, cup of water from here and also pour in a cup of water on the same side. Now for a brief moment, there's like, it's less, it's more diluted over here on the left side because there's this fresh water that just got poured in and you took out a cup of water that had spike protein in it. You took out a cup with spike protein in it, you poured in a fresh cup. Now for a few moments, there's like less spike protein here over here on the left side in your plasma. And there's more over here on the right side. But within a few moments, they they redistribute so that there's equal amounts on both sides. So then you scoop out another cup a few days later from the left side, throw it away, pour in some fresh water. 
you keep repeating that, eventually the concentration in your whole body will go lower and lower and lower and lower. Maybe it never gets to zero, but it gets so low that it doesn't affect you anymore, right? So that's the point of plasma donation, is to gradually drain your body of all the toxins that are in it. So it's, I don't know. It takes time. It doesn't happen in 10 days. It doesn't happen in maybe even two months. It, may, it might take six months. It might take a year. I don't know. A lot of people have toxins in them that have been there for really for years, you know, and so, uh, but it's proven. It's been proven in firefighters who are breathing in all sorts of toxic chemicals, blood and plasma donation, both work, blood donation, you know, you're losing a lot of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets that you don't need to lose. You're losing a lot of iron. I would not recommend that. Just do plasma donation. All right. I've probably belabored the point. Um, all right. So let's jump to the... <laughs> uh live stream um comments uh if you're having that much red meat you need to have an enzyme probiotic probiotic that meat will absolutely weight you down uh please we need to talk <laughs> who is this somebody cares about me and wants to help me um thank you that's so nice um so yeah uh i'll probably be taking um i don't know a lot of people do great on just meat with nothing else uh you know there's a lot of carnivore content out there anthony chaffee you know i I take it all with a grain of salt. I think some people, probably a, a small percentage of people, I, I think human beings are on like a bell curve, right? For most characteristics. And I think that includes like dietary diet. And why this makes evolutionary sense is that say all of a sudden we were in like an evolutionary bottleneck where there was nothing but meat and there were no plants, there would be some people optimized for that just because of random genetic variation, right? And they would do fantastic and you know, flourish and they would, you know, take over the world after that. Um, or you got into a different, you know, environmental kind of scenario where there were no, there was no meat. There were only plants. Some people would be optimized for that situation and all the, you know, meat optimized people would die off and the plant optimized people would, you know, flourish. Uh, but there would always be hopefully enough genetic variation that some people would continue being born who could work very well with meat. And then there would be a big bulk of people that, you know, do well with both. You know, they do well with meat, they do well with plants, they do well with both together, etc. So I'm not saying that, you know, pure carnivore is the diet for everyone. And as I said before, I'm not planning to do it for the rest of my life, but I'm planning to use it as a kind of like a, a an elimination diet to reset, you know, to just get rid of inflammation and um but yeah I do think it's helpful to probably add some uh kimchi or some maybe not kimchi, but like sauerkraut or something a little bit with, with the meat to help. So I do plan to do that eventually. I'm going to test sauerkraut, make sure I don't have a problem with it, and then and then start eating some sauerkraut with my meat. I just drink a tablespoon of MCT oil for constipation. Yeah, you know, there's simple things like one time I ate like an apple and my constipation went away for a couple of days, <laughs> but then it came back. So some people have a more serious constipation problem than others. Um, but uh, yeah, the MCT oil, that's a good idea. I can try that. Um, if your gut is clogged, your brain is fogged. Absolutely. I totally agree with everyone here. Um, you need to fix constipation and you need to do it very quickly because constipation is always a huge problem for your body. Dr. Hyder, I'm not vaccinated. I had COVID in 21. You helped me then. My only long COVID issue is exacerbated psoriasis. So I have a tiny bit of psoriasis. It's actually gotten a lot better in the last couple of years. I think one got better was just environmental so i moved from a very very extremely dry desert place to a very very moist place uh here in puerto rico and uh, i grew up in florida where it's also um, very very humid so i do think that there are some environmental um you know factors in a lot of chronic diseases and some people do much better in certain environments than in others so you know but that doesn't help a lot of people because they are not able to move for their chronic disease if it's something like psoriasis it's easier for them to just take a steroid um but my plan is to solve the psoriasis issue which you know it's a chronic issue it's been there for probably 30 years and it's going to take some time but uh, that's one of the plans with my elimination re you know elimination reintroduction diet that i'm journey that I'm on. Um, okay, so I read psoriasis is cytokine related. I mean, it's autoimmune disease. I went to a dermatologist and have a bunch of topicals to try. I don't have insurance and won't be taking the $50,000 biologics. I would not touch those with a 10-foot pole. I plan to take Powdarco, L-glutamine, Slippery Elm. Slippery Elm is great. Thanks for reminding me of that. I've been trying to remember the name of that thing for a while. Great for healing, like leaky gut, apparently. Saffron, maybe 10 more things to attempt systematic healing. Do you have suggestions? Yeah, my main suggestion is elimination diet. Uh, 
at least an AIP diet plus eliminate oxalate high foods and maybe leptin containing foods. But bare minimum AI autoimmune paleo protocol diet. Uh, look it up. You know, it's the same thing that I mentioned earlier with, uh, you know, it's a no sugar, no grains, no um, dairy, no eggs, no soy. I miss soy. So no soy and uh, no nightshade vegetables. That's the basic autoimmune protocol diet. Um, it helps with most autoimmune issues and will probably help a lot with psoriasis. So it, that helps to heal the gut, eliminate the things that are triggering autoimmunity. Um, you know, at least this is one theory of how it works is that you have leaky gut and you're absorbing um, partially digested food particles that haven't been broken down into, you know, the main macronutrients, which are carbs, fat, and protein. So you're digesting these partially digested particles and they are cross-reacting with your tissue. So basically your immune system sees those as foreign and they're like, okay, we got to develop antibodies to this. We got to destroy them. We got to, you know, eliminate them. But then those antibodies cross-react with certain tissues like your thyroid or your skin or wherever you have a, an autoimmune issue. And then your body's attaching, attacking those tissues as well as the food particles. And this thing just keeps going um, until you eliminate those food particles. And then your immune system calms down that stops creating the antibiotics cross-reacting with your own tissues. So some foods like high gluten, you know, grains particularly um, seem to stimulate leaky gut in some people, which can lead to this problem. And some things like a vaccine insult can injure that gut barrier um, and create the leaky gut, which then leads to the uh, autoimmune issue. Um, long COVID, you know, the, one of the theories is that similar to a vaccine injury, it went into the bloodstream and then it um, transfected this lining cells of the gut and caused them to be damaged and the gut got leaky and then it ends up in this kind of vicious cycle, which just perpetuates until you remove kind of the trigger foods. And it's not that those foods can't be good for you ever. Again, it's just that right now they're a trigger and you have to eliminate them, heal the gut with things like slippery elm. And, you know, so the first thing is eliminate the ongoing damage causing agents and then take some things that help to heal up the gut you know and speed up the process of healing the gut um, and then give it give it enough time which can be months you know three four months in many cases uh, and then slowly reintroduce those foods that you had eliminated um, one at a time testing them slowly making sure you're not reacting and and I wouldn't even start the retesting phase until the psoriasis or whatever it is you're trying to treat was completely gone. So the most extreme version of elimination diet that I've ever seen is not actually the lion diet. It's the GAPS diet, which was developed by, I think, a physician or nutritionist or some, some sort of biologist or somebody, you know, in the biological sciences for, I think it was her child who had, I think it was autism. Um, and she cured this kid's autism, uh, if it was autism. Uh, but so one of those serious neuro neurodevelopmental disorders was com completely, completely cured by this really strict diet, which she called the GAPS diet. And the GAPS diet eliminates everything <laughs> except for bone broth, right? You don't even have boiled meat in the bone broth. It's just bone broth in the beginning. And then you add like boiled meat, and then you add red meat, and then and then you go up the list of you know things step by step, basically rebuilding the gut, reestablishing tolerance to to some of these uh, foods. And there may be some foods that you can never tolerate, or you can only tolerate them in small quantities, right? So, in the modern world, we see a food and we like it, and we just eat it to excess, and we just eat it whenever we feel like it, and we eat it and eat it and eat it, right? It's like my kids with bananas. It's just like they look like monkeys. They're just eating bananas all day long. And it, you know, a lot of times these food reactions develop to things when you overdo them. So I myself, throughout my life, I've known that like if I eat a few bites of banana, I don't, I don't, I feel great. I feel fine, no problem. But if I eat an entire banana or more than an entire banana, I start to feel kind of slightly weird, right? Not terrible but a little bit weird. Like it doesn't feel right. It feels a little bit off. And there's other things like that for me too. You know, if I eat like a piece of the fruit versus if I eat a bowl of it. Right. And, uh, and so I think one of the things that is like that for me is like one of the melons, right? Like a honeydew melon or something. I can eat a little bit, but if I keep eating it, my throat just starts to feel funny. It's like I have a tolerance. I have a certain level of tolerance for it. And some people have that level of tolerance for dairy. Like you can have some, but not too much. And so you have to learn to start listening to your body and like 
following through on the message that's sending you that like I can eat just so much and not more and and that'll be fine for me and if I overdo it then I might start to get sick seriously sick if I keep doing it long enough um, so these little signals I think are very very important and they can clue you in to the things that you should not be doing if something makes you feel even slightly unwell you shouldn't be doing it um, all right, so yeah, so to this Facebook user asking where are you getting questions, I can't get a reply and no other comments. Um, we collect questions every week um, throughout the week. And so we start off answering these questions that have been asked um, throughout the week. And then if I have time, I move on to the, the actual live questions. This week, since you mentioned it, um, we moved to the live questions in the middle. Uh, so I may not even get to the recorded questions, but I will try. Maybe we'll go a little bit longer today um, just to complete as much as we can. Um, what can help uh, the Facebook user, maybe you or maybe somebody else, it doesn't say the name, uh, what can help the uh, MAC lung disease after COVID shot, uh, MAC maybe lung disease? Um, so are you talking about like uh, uh, a, uh, like a tuberculosis kind of lung disease? Um, let me see. Just to make sure I remember this. Uh... Yeah, it's um, non tuberculous mycobacterial. Sorry, I meant mycobacterial. Yeah, non tuberculous mycobacterial infection. So Mycobacterium avium intracellular, or one of these um, atypical mycobacteria. Um, so, yeah, Mycobacterium avium complex. Uh, yeah, so if that's what you're talking about, um, then obviously there's medications that you can use. Um, and the other things that you can do are inhaled iodine, inhaled hydrogen peroxide, um, and also just the inhaled oxygen that I was talking about earlier, um, as well as. Uh, if if it becomes really severe, if it becomes like fibrotic lung disease, um, then one of the things that's really helpful is probably inhaled heparin. This is being used a lot in Europe. It's kind of hard to get it done here, but it should be possible to do here, even if you have to use just like the regular injectable heparin, but you, we tell you how to put it into the nebulizer machine and nebulize it. Excuse me. Um, so yeah. Um, it depends on how bad it is, but if it's just early stages, then um, then I would start off with the inhalable um, hydrogen peroxide iodine and just optimizing everything else about your nutrition and your lifestyle so that we can um, help your immune system to get to it. And the other final thing, yeah, glad I remembered, high dose IV vitamin C. I mean, this works for... Um, mycobacterial uh, diseases, the studies have been done on it, and it may be, you know, the single most effective uh, treatment out there. So get 50 to 100 grams of IV vitamin C twice a week at least, go to a clinic that did administer such high doses. Um, there's one in Houston, um, they're, they're, they're all over the place, but, you know, there's, it's hard, you have to like search and call them and ask like how high of a dose they give because a lot of people say we do IV vitamin C high dose but it's only 10 grams or less and and that's what they think is high dose high dose means 50 to 100 grams and oftentimes for a serious infection like mac you might have to go to 100 grams twice a week if you can't get anywhere to do an IV of 100 grams then try the oral dosing 50 to 100 grams orally um and and see if that makes a difference so um obviously you can't smoke um, when you have this thing going on. So optimize nutrition, probably do an elimination diet. Just do everything possible to eliminate inflammation in your body, optimize nutrition so that your body itself, its own, your own immune system can get started on um, beating this thing back and getting rid of it. Um, let me just check up to date if there's any um, specific things beyond supportive care recommended. But the main thing is you just have to optimize your own immune system. So that can include things like vitamin A, vitamin D, you know, E, K2, and all the other micronutrients that you might be deficient in. And the best way to figure out what those are is to actually test for them. And, you know, that can get kind of expensive, but...
Let's see. All right, so yeah, so mild to moderate, non-cavitary, nodular, bronchiectatic, uh, MAC infection, you would be uh, three times weekly azithromycin, rifampin, ethambutol. Um, if it was cavitary or severe, then it would be azithromycin, azithromycin rifampin, ethambutol, but it would be daily. Um, and then you can also use IV amicacin and streptomycin um, for the first eight to 12 weeks. So yeah, I mean, if somebody has something like this, you take it seriously and and get rid of it. So those are the drug treatments. Um, but at the same time, I would do everything else possible, especially the high dose IV vitamin C. Um, all right, so that's not something I use, I've probably ever treated or seen, but uh, you should definitely be seeing a pulmonologist in this situation. Uh, for gastritis, before COVID, I took L-glutamine, mm, also in cabbage, I guess it's president cabbage, maybe. Um, DGL licorice, pepsid, zinc carnosine for the ulcer topic, just to share. Thank you. Um, Ryan says, can I ask questions here or just via email? Yeah, you can ask questions here. Um, not sh can't guarantee that I'm going to get to all the questions, but shoot, go for it. Um, maybe that is a list of questions that were submitted earlier. Yeah, yeah. I guess you figured it out before I got to it. Um, probiotics and real CBD, not oil. A real CBD feeds good gut bacteria. Um, are there any protein powders that are anti-inflammatory? I have psoriasis and I'm trying to kick it. I mean, I would avoid dairy-based protein powders. So you can get, nowadays, you can get beef, powdered beef. Uh, you know, the, just lo look up like beef powder, um, carnivore beef powder or whatever. So like, you know, since the carnivore diet has become more popular, I actually found there's a, a beef flour <laughs> made out of powdered beef. So I guess that would be a, an anti-inflammatory powder. Um, you know, so I think that would probably be better than definitely avoid pea protein powder. Um, and um, the dairy protein powder might be okay, but because it, but some people might have an issue with it. So, so avoid pea protein. Try, uh, yeah, avoid pea protein. Uh, peas have a lot of oxalates in them. Um, so that can be very inflammatory for some people. All right, I, I'm not. I'm just going to show some of these. I'm not really sure what they mean. You need all the omegas to bombard, I guess, the infection. Less known secret: eat cold potatoes can help pull the bioweapon out. Um, and maybe that acts as some sort of binder in the gut. Uh, vitamin E. I don't know what this is. Um, once I took algal DHA. I wonder if that is a good, good alternative. Fish oil. I mean, the point is that it's still an, it's still DHA, right? So you want to get some. Obviously, EPA DHA are necessary. Um, it's just a matter of should you be taking super high doses or not. And if you go and read the the literature, especially that um, particular you know post that I mentioned, it's probable that it's not good for you long term. If you want to go even deeper down the rabbit hole, Google Chris Master John and omega threes. And there's um, posts as well as I think YouTube videos that he's done on it. And it's just problematic for a lot of people. A lot of people end up much worse than they started and they have to actually detox from, um, which takes time. The same as getting rid of seed oils from your body's tissues. It takes a year or two to just like get rid of these because they become constituents of all your cell walls. So if you have too much, um, it can become problematic. Dr. Ryder, how can we talk, please? And thank you. Yeah, just uh, you can sign up at Push Health and send us a message. Um, you can, text, you know, send me a message on Twitter. It's at Dr. Syed Hyder. Um, but yeah, I don't know that I have time to talk to everyone, but certainly if somebody is trying to help me out or if I can help them out in some way, um, those are two avenues that are open right now. Although, I, again, I, I'm not checking Twitter that often anymore. Uh, Barbara Smith says parasites are in fish. 
Uh, parasites are in everything, um, or they can be, and you know, proper cooking can usually get rid of um, a lot of problems. But uh, pork can have some serious parasites in it. <laughs> some really disgusting images I've seen on social media of uh, cysts and pork. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, poor quality meat can certainly have parasites. Uh, uh, is, I'm not sure, COVID possible shedding, no jab, is there anything I should do? Um, all right, maybe I had COVID and maybe possible shedding, no jab, is there anything I should do? Yeah, so I don't know if you, if you mean that you're being exposed to shedding or you either had COVID or you had shedding that made you feel sick briefly or whether you have long COVID. Um, check out my go-to-doc.com. We have protocols for acute COVID and long COVID. So if you're still feeling sick, then definitely there's things you can do. Um, what kind of green shakes do you recommend with maybe low oxalate greens? Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Um, one of the sh things that's recommended by the FLCCC is uh, Cardio Miracle. I don't know if that qualifies as a green shake, but uh, it seems to have some um, vegetable nutrients in it. Um, I know a lot of people have used green juicing to get a lot better from things like cancer. So. The Gerson protocol, uh, I've seen it used, um, or maybe perhaps a modified version of it used, where a good friend of mine has cured cancer over and over again, probably hundreds of cases at this point. It's his protocols are very extensive and very hard to put, you know, to actually do, and it requires almost it's almost like a full time job. You're juicing like four or five, six times a day sometimes, and you're getting sun, and you're slathering castor oil all, all over yourself and you're doing castor oil packs and you're you know just all it's like really really intense um you know all these things that he tells you to do and you're taking this supplement that supplement etc but a, but a big part of it and where he started one of the pillars of his treatment started with the gerson protocol and uh what he would say is juice um broccoli cauliflower um juice uh, spinach um which does have oxalates in it, but you know, juice spinach. I think kale is one of the lower oxalate ones. Um, I think that was part of his recommendations. And then he would add like a piece of turmeric the size of your thumb and a piece of ginger the size of your thumb, and I think a few cloves of garlic into this juice. So the juice is utterly disgusting. I mean, it's really gross and it's really strong and it's really hard to drink, but uh, it's it's pretty powerful for some people. Again, you gotta like figure out what you're trying to do here. So on the one hand, some people may have a problem, serious issues with juicing. And I've seen people who do develop serious issues with juicing due to oxalates and other things. Uh, and other people um, get a lot better when they juice. So I can't recommend to any particular person or, you know, just generally juicing for everyone. Have you met or talked with Dr. Brownstein? No, he's very good. He was harassed by the government for his early treatment protocols. Yeah, I think, wasn't he the one who had published something about uh, inhaling the hydrogen peroxide or the iodine or both? Yeah, I'd love to talk to him if anyone knows how to get in touch with him. Uh, I got sick many times from the first jab. I just got over respiratory issues five weeks ago. Um, does vitamin D replace sunlight? No, this is a great question. Um, it's an important point. Uh, will a red light tanning bed help um, regular UVB tanning for a few minutes? Yeah, so UVB, getting UVB light should help. I'm not an expert on tanning beds, so I don't know if that's a great way to do it, but you can get something kind of called a light box, I think, that has a UVB lamp that you can just put on your desk to get um, vitamin D. And, uh, and so sunlight, the beneficial wavelengths, the main ones are, so the, the red end in the spectrum has red, infrared, near infrared, and then there's a UVA and UVB, and then there's you know all the visible colors. And the visible colors include blue light. And so most people get way too much blue light without enough balancing UVA, UVB, and infrared. So the UVA specifically in sunlight um, 
triggers nitric oxide production, which lowers blood pressure. You know, it's great for your blood vessels. One of the things that CardioMerical is meant to do is to improve nitric oxide production, but you can get nitric oxide just for free from UVA. And, and it also breaks down stress hormones. And the blue light actually upregulates stress hormones and incre increases the stress hormone levels. So these two wavelengths balance each other out so that you don't have too much stress hormones, you don't have too much blood vessel constriction from the stress hormones. They're in a perfect balance and you get that from sunlight until you don't. So when the sunlight passes through your window glass, it blocks out the UVA, the UVB, and the red end of the spectrum. And you get the visible spectrum with all, too much blue light that's not balanced out by UVA. Um, the only way to solve that solution and remain indoors is to either completely open the window so that the light actually enters your home without passing through glass or to replace all the glass with quartz glass, in which case 90% of all the entire spectrum enters and you're not blocking UVA, UVB, or infrared, or near infrared or red. So if you, the other solution is to try to supplement with sunlight and near infrared and red and infrared and UV wavelengths, right? So it's not perfect, but that's one thing that you can do. Um, and you would do it maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day for each of those. And you can turn on all those lights at the same time, you know, while you're working and just uh, the infrared, near infrared, red, those pass through your clothing uh, quite well. But it's best to you know remove the clothing if you can to get the maximum benefits. But like ninety percent will pass through one layer of most colors of clothing. You know eighty five percent will even pass through two layers of most colors. So you, you get a lot of benefit even with clothing. But the UVA UVB uh, you need to have it directly on your skin to make vitamin D. So sunlight is very beneficial, and those are at least some of the ways that we know it's beneficial. The infrared actually helps to improve your mitochondria's ability to create energy from the nutrients that you eat so it uh, and also the infrared also seems to structure the water inside our blood vessels um, and maybe kind of like charge a kind of water battery that's pleasant present inside the water of our blood blood um, along the edges of blood vessels so very interesting stuff uh, light is really powerful and obviously getting at the right time of day will get you in sync, get your circadian rhythm in sync, which means that your cortisol will be high in the morning and low at night. And, you know, thyroid and all the other hormones will be released at the right time and turned off at the wrong time, or they'll be high at the right time, low at the right time, so that you can sleep optimally and recover optimally. So circadian rhythms are extremely important for just functioning of all of your tissues. And uh, if they're not if they're not, the circadian rhythms aren't synced properly, you know, from sunlight and when you eat and when you wake up and all these things, then your body just won't work properly and you won't sleep properly, you won't recover properly, uh, you won't be alert and awake and, you know, full of energy at the right time and you won't be tired and sleepy at the right time. Swimming helps you manage stress. Yeah, do whatever it takes to manage your stress. Um, Although, I mean, if you're swimming in a pool, then there is this issue with chlorine, you know, chlorine exposure. There are other ways to clean pools, actually. You know, you can use iodine even. Um, plus, I think hydrogen peroxide or iodine hydrogen peroxide and even UV light. And so there's other ways other than chlorine, but uh, they're not usually used, which would probably be healthier. Um, one way to relax is to lie on a heating pad under your back. Absolutely. That's a great way to relax. Only issue with heating, most heating pads is there's a lot of, there's some EMF coming out of the electrical heating pad, but maybe it's more beneficial than harmful. Um, do you have any advice for someone who's severely vaccinated? Or they have something almost like ALS now from it, just trying to help this person. He's not finding the help he needs. So um, there's a sub stack uh, specifically on ALS. Um, Dr. Grauf has a sub stack and he publishes a Grauf neuro protocol that you can get from his sub stack. And you can also send him $5 on PayPal and he'll send you a PDF with all of his protocols. So there's that Grauf neuro protocol is a supplement uh, nutraceutical protocol, which I could recommend. And then um, uh, what's his name? Um, let me see, hold on a second. At blog.mygoto.com, um, the pinned blog is about cancer, and 
I go over, yeah, Adam Gertner's, and okay, so Adam Gertner has a Substack. It's very, very virology.substack.com. And he has also published a medication based ALS protocol, um, curing the incurable ALS. So I would take a look at that. And you need somebody, probably a, um, so Google curing the incurable colon ALS, uh, or just go to veryvirology.substack.com and search for ALS. Um, and he, I mean, this is a complicated protocol and it includes a lot of um, prescription drugs uh, and some nutraceuticals. Uh, includes uh, things like Lamictal and uh, let's see, phenylbutyrate and um, some, other, some other nutraceuticals. So that's a starting point to begin talking to a functional neurologist maybe about how to treat ALS. And uh, that's a good, those two places are good, good places to start for that. And then obviously just uh, long COVID treatment, um, standard long COVID treatment that we, that I do, um, ivermectin escalating doses with um, LDN to start with and all the micronutrients and then detox in general, you know, does supplements help you detox from spike as well as plasma donation and just uh optimizing all of your lifestyle factors a sun and sleep and you know stress management and food and all of that and you know maybe consider an elimination diet um all right uh, this is an interesting idea for stress management the therapist jeff thompson who has some sort of healing or soothing music beat for for relaxing um uh okay uh yes um yeah we test our supplements are all tested for um toxins so that's not an issue um can covid amplify emf sensitivity and a lot of people it does um so you just have to treat the long covid uh and try to eliminate the EMFs as much as possible until you're better. So some people will have trouble with large screens, but not as much trouble with small screens. Some people will have trouble with Wi-Fi, not as much trouble with, um, you know, a wired connection. So, you know, there's things you can do. You can have, make everything wired in your house, you know, shut off the Wi-Fi, shut off your cell signal, have a wired internet connection, have a wired keyboard that's connected to a computer that's farther away from you. So like if you're using a laptop, you move the laptop back on your desk or away from you and connect it by a cable to a monitor and connect it by a cable to a um, keyboard and connect it by a cable to a mouse. Don't use any Bluetooth and, uh, and keep the actual laptop itself farther away from you. Um, Minimize your use of the phone. Minimize your use of electronics. Um, minimize your, um, you know, figure out whether you have very, very strong electrical EMFs around your environment. So there's EMF testing kits and devices, and they some of them get, you know, into the hundreds of dollars. Um, check your dirty electricity and your wiring. That's another thing. Um, there's something called Greenfield filters and, and a different brand as well. Um, these can be a little bit um, perhaps dangerous. I mean, I've, I've heard of one person at least having a house fire when they plugged in these dirty electricity filters, which are meant to decrease the dirty electricity in your wiring. But this was a very big problem, especially in older construction. I think it's become less and less of a problem in the last 10, 20 years, but uh, some houses just their wiring is has a lot of these this quote unquote dirty electricity, which can, the, these spikes in, um, the electricity passing through the wiring that are that can cause you know people who are EMF sensitive to have serious issues, and then some of the newer um, smart uh, what are they called the smart boxes, um, smart electrical you know the boxes that um, track your electricity usage. Anyway, some of the new smart meters are problematic for some people, so maybe you could like enclose it in like a in a like a box that um blocks all of its 
the EMF that's coming off of it. <clears throat> Certain lights also, I think it's the uh, CFLs, the compact fluorescent bulbs, and maybe even the LEDs emit a lot of EMFs. But, you know, the farther away you are from them, you know, the EMF drops off as a square of the distance away from it. The microwave emits EMFs. You know, a lot of things emit EMFs. And so you may have, a, you, most people have a certain tolerance level when they become sensitive. And as long as they dip below that tolerance threshold, they feel fine. Um, I remember, well, the spinoff from Breaking Bad is a, it's a TV show with um, the lawyer from Breaking Bad, and I forget the name of the TV show on HBO. Probably um, watched, used to watch it a long time ago and finish it. But uh, his brother, uh, it's this ongoing joke, thinks that he's EMF sensitive, but the show, you know, the show writers are just making fun of it and like acting as though if it doesn't actually exist and it's just this like pseudoscientific thing and the guy's crazy and whatever um but but it does unfortunately actually exist or it seems to um it exists just as much as shedding exists you know the it exists as much as um, vaccine injury exists i mean the evidence for it is there and some people are sensitive to it and there are physiological changes that happen from uh well, yeah better call Saul. That's the show. Um, but there are definitely uh, physiological changes um, due to the, you know, the effects on tissues. And the same playbook that was used to during the pandemic to discredit ivermectin, all this stuff, um, and to discredit vaccine injuries, et cetera, has been used for decades. Like if you go back and read some of the work that's been done on bioelectrical fields, um, there was a book by somebody um, that I was reading. It was written like 20 or 30 years ago, I think in the 80s. And he's describing step by step all the same stuff that the government did during COVID to, you know, you know, gaslight people about vaccine injuries, doing the exact same stuff to people who were um, experimenting on the effect of um non-ionizing electromagnetic fields on human tissues. There is a tremendous amount of research that's been done on these non-ionizing fields. And the reason that the government gaslighted everyone and minimized it and used all, like packed the, you know, the committees with their own scientists that were in and like created their own research to discredit the other research and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Was, it all just boils down to this is important for military work, right? Like we need to use these electromagnetic fields for the military. And so no matter what we need to do, we're going to prove that they're safe, right? Even though they're extremely unsafe and deleterious to human health. And I think you can argue, arguably say that was the exact same reason that COVID vaccine injury was minimized because this was a DOD operation from the beginning and vaccines in general are a defense operation. All the vaccines that we use all the childhood vaccines, the only reason they exist is to maintain a vaccine injury that the Department of Defense can use in wartime. Um, if you don't have an ongoing vaccine injury or vaccine industry that's continually making vaccines and continuing to work on that science, the science will die out. It's like, you know, the science it took to get to the moon. We just don't know how to build it anymore, right? So we can recreate it from scratch, which, you know, people are trying to do now. But the actual technology that we used, since it did not continue to be used, it just, the, the know-how got lost. How do you make it? How do you machine this stuff? How do you build all the parts? You know, the, the manufacturing capacity, all of it, it's like lost knowledge, right? So, and I understand some people don't believe the moon landing happened, but regardless, the point is the same, that if you don't pursue an avenue of knowledge and you stop using it, you stop developing it, eventually you forget how to even do it. And the same would happen for vaccines unless the military um, insisted that we continue to produce them and shoot them in the kids' arms. And it's almost like an excuse to maintain military res readiness. We have to shoot all these kids with vaccines. Um, that appears to be the situation to me anyway. How sh often should one donate plasma? As often as they'll let you, as often as you can tolerate it, you know. So um, just eat a nutrient-dense diet to replace the few things that you lose in the plasma other than water. Um, and you could do it maybe once a week. I I've heard some people do it twice a week. Back when I was in college, I donated it a few times just to make some money. And I don't remember. I think it was probably twice a week that they allowed it. But uh, depending on the person, they may limit how often you can do it. 
maybe to twice a month or once a week, but uh, you can do it as frequently as you want. Is you just have to remain, remain hydrated because you're losing a lot of water and they're and may, they may not replace the water and and you have to rebuild some plasma proteins and recover some micro, some small amount of micronutrients just because they're being physically removed from your body uh is coffee one cup with real cream acceptable i have worsened psoriasis since covid i read info online it says small dose of coffee is okay i'm not sure obviously um so i i think ideally you would eliminate coffee or at least go decaf uh, because the caffeine itself I don't think it's possible that it doesn't affect anyone's sleep. Even if you're a rapid metabolizer, there's still going to be some caffeine in your system. It's going to disrupt your sleep and you're not going to get the optimal sleep that you need to recover. Um, that plus coffee, generally speaking, there's a lot of mold toxins in most coffees. So there was one brand that I just found um, that is... Um, uh, that is that specifically is i think organic and um has has been tested for you know to be free of mycotoxins so that's that's what you would look for mycotoxin free coffee and preferably de preferably decaf the issue you know with putting um cream in it is that a lot of people with chronic illnesses chronic inflammation are going to react to um, dairy products and they would want to eliminate dairy. Cream is basically butter and maybe some people can tolerate the cream because it doesn't have as much of the, you know, the dairy proteins in it. So cream is essentially the same thing as butter. You know, you whip cream long enough, it turns into butter. And then when you take the butter and you turn it into clarified butter or butter oil, then there will be a little bit at the bottom of dairy proteins and sugars and glycoproteins and stuff, which has a slightly fleet, sweet taste, which separates out from the butter. So that is also present in the creams, cream. So there's a little, there, there are some of those, you know, things that some people may react to in cream. Otherwise, you know, all these people talking about putting butter in their coffee, I'm like, what are you talking about? Just put cream in your coffee. It's literally the exact same thing. And it's just, it's going to taste better than putting butter in your coffee. Maybe butter tastes good, but it doesn't taste the same as cream, right? Butter has a taste, cream has a different taste, even though they're exact same thing. They're just like two different forms of the same underlying thing. Uh, but cream goes a lot better in coffee than butter does. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've tried it. Um, yeah, I love cream in, in coffee or in tea or whatever. Uh, like, you know, most places you can't get pure cream in your coffee, but uh, they'll give you a half and half in some places. It's called like a breve latte is it with half and half. So I, I, I like coffee. I don't drink a lot of it. But um, for my elimination diet, I've gone off of it. Um, once I get to the point where I start to add back things, I might try a mycotoxin-free organic decaf coffee to start with just to see how it tastes you know because I, I like the taste of it you know um i don't know that the caffeine in it is that important to me and i think most people should probably eliminate caffeine until they've completely healed um and even then you do it in moderation and once you dial in your sleep you really do not need caffeine it is not necessary it, it's just stealing from from you you know it, it's stealing from you to keep you awake and and it's not worth it at all uh, and yeah, with the with the psoriasis, you should eliminate the the caffeine. So if you want a book on psoriasis, check out I think it's John Pagano's Healing Psoriasis. Um, it's basically it's like the same diet over and over again. Um, tiny little tweaks here and there with some of the supplements, but like it's the same program as healing any autoimmune disease. It's essentially the AIP diet, um, but there are some little bits and pieces that might be a little bit different with John Pagano's book. Um, compared to, for example, like the MS protocol um, that was published by uh, that doctor who had MS and cured herself. And, you know, the whole 30 is also kind of the AIP diet. So it's like, and the AIP diet has been studied for um, other autoimmune diseases like uh, IBD. Uh, I don't have a good source of Chinese. Okay, so for Chinese medicine, what I would do is I would contact either Sissima JB's clinic in Asheville, North Carolina, or um, I'm blanking on his name. They have two very different schools of Chinese medicine that they practice. Um, but uh, I, I think Sissima JB's clinic will um, long distance. Uh, 
but I know for sure that uh, this other one, I think it's the alternative clinic, alternativeclinic.org in Asheville. Just let me confirm this right one. Yep, that's the one. So alternativeclinic.org, uh, Andrew Nugent. See, if you can either see Andrew Nugent or his wife, Julianne Nugent, he, sorry, Nugent Head. So Andrew Nugent Head or Julianne Nugent Head, they're probably the two best practitioners there. They're all good there, but these two are kind of like the masters of their school in the world, Andrew specifically, and, and his wife is also incredibly um, good. So tr Andrew's almost always booked out for like two months straight and people will like literally log on Sunday at like midnight for when the next week opens up two months out and fill out the schedule almost immediately. <laughs> so he's in extremely high demand. Um, his wife is way more available and I think she's probably equally as good. So if you can get Andrew, if you can't then get Julianne and uh, you can call their clinic, you can see them. Um, so again, they practice almost like a completely different style, and different kind of approach and philosophy of Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine compared to Sissy Majabi's clinic. And she's also kind of like master level in her own kind of school. Um, and her clinic, uh, I mean, let's see. Um, and at her school, I would try to get Sissy Majabi herself or her longtime partner who is, um, so I think her clinic is ChineseAcupuncturClinic.com, maybe. You, you can tell that she got this name like 20, 30 years ago <laughs> before anyone else. Um, yeah, so she's been practicing for a long time. Uh, so I don't remember her long time. The, the, she has a partner who's all who has been working with her for 20, 30 years as well. They kind of started the clinic together. Um, who would also be great. Maybe it's Ann Woolman, but it doesn't sound right. Uh, and that partner may have also retired. You know, the other people are younger. They have less experience. They're also very good, but uh, I don't think as good as Sissy. So if you can get Sissy or Andrew, if not, then um, one of the other people who have been there for 10, 20 years at least. Um, and so I think both of them probably do telemedicine, but I, I know for sure that Andrew and his wife used to do telemedicine. So if you want, you know, Chinese herbs, um, you can get it perhaps from them or you can ask them where they get theirs. I know Andrew and Julianne, they actually grow a lot of their own herbs on their own farm in Asheville. Um, but they would be the best people to ask, like, what's a good place to source Chinese herbs? And then they would also be great to... <laughs> to just get a diagnosis and an actual herbal prescription. And then if you get a prescription from them, from them, they will ship you their own herbs, you know, in that prescription. I don't know that they'll sell you wholesale or sell you whatever you feel like getting yourself, but if you ask them what you need, then they'll certainly, obviously with Chinese medicine, it's optimal to go there and have a pulse diagnosis, at least for the first visit, if you can, if and even for every other visit. But uh, yeah, these couple of people, or these couple of clinics are very advanced and, um, there's others out there, obviously. There's one in uh, Chicago, but I forget the name of the guy. Um, is horse chestnut useful for blood vessel healing? Yeah, I don't know anything about horse chestnut. Um, what are your thoughts on lumbrokinase? I think it's meant, it's purported to be much stronger than uh, natokinase seropeptase bromelain. So if you're going to take it uh, for some reason, then I would probably stop all the other all of those other ones and just start with lumbar kinase and then slowly add the others and see how you tolerate it and check your labs and check for D-dimer, check for other things. And and the key thing here is D-dimer oftentimes will go up and that's usually a good thing. It doesn't, it's not a bad thing. Like trying to get D-dimer to go from positive to negative is not the ultimate goal. I mean, actually it may be the ultimate goal because that means that there's no more clots, but while there are clots, which can usually take five, six, seven months or more to completely get rid of, the D, if the D-dimer is positive, it means you're breaking down those microclots. And if it's negative, it means you're not breaking down the microclots. So lumbar kinase may turn a D-dimer positive, and that would be a good thing. It wouldn't be a bad thing because it means you're actually finally breaking up the very hard to break up microclots. Uh, I've seen auction in a bottle for about $10 at Walmart. Is that useful? No, it's not useful. That's a waste of money. Just rent the auction concentrator for $50 um, because that's going to be like a squirt of oxygen that's going to last for, what, 10 seconds, 30 seconds. You know, it, that's not useful. No, it's not useful at all. It's a waste of your money. Um, you want to breathe it in for an hour twice a day, 
pure 100 percent oxygen only way to do that is oxygen concentrator or in a hospital um okay uh i've been experiencing pretty extreme muscle twitching all over for 16 months uh is the muscle twitching post-covid vaccine common it's relatively common it's one of those things i keep hearing over and over again but it's like when you say common probably less than 1% of people who have a vaccine injury get the muscle twitching, but you know, it's, but there's a lot of sim like kind of like long tail symptoms like that. It's like less than 1% of the people get them, but you keep hearing like, maybe most practitioners won't have heard of them, but I probably have treated more than most people in the world. So yes, I've heard of this and it's relatively calm. I mean, as I said, relative is relative, but, but yeah, it, I've heard of it. Um, will this eventually go away. Yes. It, most of the symptoms eventually go away if you wait long enough. Um, and again, you could do a neuro protocol. You could do just the basic protocol. So you can look at Dr. Grauf's neuro protocol. You can look at just the basic, you know, long haul vax injury protocol that we have. Um, and it'll usually help to get rid of it and get rid of the microclots, get rid of the spike protein, do the detox. Um, all right. Uh, Okay, I'm going to try to get through these because some of them, I mean, it's just like uh, a lot of comments. I'm going to try to get to the questions. Um, uh, I've done intermittent fasting, which I love, but I'm trying juice fasting. Uh, that can help some people. I'm trying to kick psoriasis. I'm planning to find good recipes for the right green juices. Um, where can you buy an oxygen concentrator? You can buy them at any medical supply store. There's usually multiple medical supplies in every town, even small towns. Um, and you can also, I would say, rent it just for the first month just to make sure that you like it and it's a good quality one and you're using it and everything. But yeah, they should probably be five to $700 for most oxygen concentrators. Um, Okay, this is very nice. Thank you for the sentiment. Um, goodbye lupus.com with Dr. Go. Goodbye lupus.com. This is interesting. Um, I haven't heard of that before. Uh, I don't know why comments are disappearing. Um, Dr. Berg also suggested in his online YouTube's Tudka, a bile salt for psoriasis, along with vitamin D and high doses of L-glutamine in water in the morning and night. Um, so I just want to mention here that like things like psoriasis, these chronic inflammatory diseases that are very, very multifactorial, there's not one cause, right? You, you have to have a comprehensive lifestyle protocol. It's the same as what I recommend for long COVID. You need comprehensive lifestyle supplement you know, medication, everything protocol. It has to be very comprehensive. You have to cover all your bases because you don't know what the ingredients are in your particular case that's creating your psoriasis. And if you try to guess them, you're usually almost always going to get it wrong. Okay. If you go down some rabbit hole and you find some comment uh, somewhere on Reddit of one person who had psoriasis, who did these three things and the psoriasis went away and you're like, oh my God, that sounds exactly like me. This must work for me. And you go to a doctor and you get it prescribed. It's not going to work for you. Okay. <laughs> Trust me. That never works. It never works. I'm willing to like humor people and I'm willing to do it. It never works. Okay. <laughs> there are a million and one reasons why you have psoriasis or, or there are a million and one reasons why people in general get psoriasis and each specific person in the world who has psoriasis probably has like five to 15 reasons out of those million one reasons that are different than the next person who has psoriasis, even if their clinical picture is exactly the same, even if they're the same age and the same skin color and the same race and the same sex, and they got psoriasis at the same time and everything, even if they're twins, okay, it's probably a little bit different, even in twins, and especially in those who are not twins. So um, you just, people have to realize this, that the end result does not tell you what the cause is. There are many, many causes that lead to the same end result. It's called psoriasis or long COVID or whatever, right? Um, okay, I feel like I got lost um, in the comments, unless some of them are repeated. Uh, yeah, Chris Master John, a great person to follow on his Substack. Um, Kale is a thyroid disruptor. Yeah, this is the issue with one of the issues with kale for sure, especially when you're eating a lot in a green juice. I mean, you're getting tremendous quantities of these things that would not be possible to eat. So they're turning into like medications um, at those levels when you're juicing them. Um, 
All right, so, all right, here's uh, Dr. Brownstein. Interesting, thank you for drbrownstein.com about um, phone from Dr. Brownstein's website. Phagnum moss is another way to clean pools. Awesome, I mean, learn something new every day. That's tremendous, that's amazing. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I'm just gonna throw some magnum moss whenever I build a pool. Uh, I'll, I'll Google it, I'll figure out how to do it. But uh, that sounds amazing, it sounds so cool. <laughs> um, that's awesome. I, I went down this rabbit hole of like how to like build a natural pool and like make it healthy and blah, blah, blah. I did not come across sphagnum moss. You know, Google, there's a limit to what you can get on Google, right? Without knowing what to ask. I spent days on this at one point, trying to figure out how to create like a perfect, all natural, perfectly healthy, you know, pool. And and I never got around to sphagnum moss. <laughs> um, we'll definitely look it up. That's cool. I never ended up making the pool, but, you know, <laughs> I get like that with something sometimes, you know, you just want to figure out how it would be done. Um, all right, uh, it's a specific species with antiseptic properties. All right, um, I'm one of your patients, never vax, never sick. I saw your post on high volume vitamin C to hold flu. I've used Canmao Link successfully for several years to do this. and wonder if you're familiar with it and, and or have an opinion on it. Um, I haven't used that one. I mean, uh, there were a couple of um, ones that I have heard of, but I'll look this one up. Um, for colds and that were recommended by people. Um, I, you know, I get the sense that a lot of these, you know, Chinese practitioners, they'll, they won't recommend like the, the really powerful stuff because that can be harmful for some people. So it's like, they want to get you the right medicine for the right person at the right time and trying to give like a generic prescription that anyone can use is a lot more difficult. Um, to do and sometimes the generic ones will not be as powerful as if you get like the perfect one for you based on your specific pulse and situation and everything at that time but um and if there is something that could be generically used that is really powerful then there may be some drawbacks you know so but i don't know about can meddling i'm i'm, I'm or gan meddling um i you know people some people may know here that i spent like one semester <laughs> in a Chinese medicine school uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, right before everything ramped up and I had to drop out and go do, you know, treat people for COVID and stuff. And if I went back to it, I'd probably just like apprentice myself to Andrew or, you know, Sissy or some other, you know, high level practitioners instead of trying to go through school because it felt kind of like a waste of time um, because it wasn't really the the experience you want. It's not like they don't really, they have to teach a certain kind of curriculum. It's not the classical cur curriculum that you would prefer. And really, I mean, what is classical? I mean, it's just a hodgepodge of different schools. There's thousands of different schools. You just have to go find a, an approach that you like and learn from the person who does it. And it's a lot faster, more direct if you're already a medical practitioner. Um, all right, colchicine for inflammation. How long, if you stop, could it exacerbate the symptoms? Ivermectin is great, but symptoms do tend to come back sometimes. Um, I mean, I guess, since we're getting so many live questions, maybe next time we'll start with the live questions and try to answer them in real time instead of like, I mean, at this point we're like, I don't know, probably uh, 20, 30, 30 minutes behind. Like like this question was asked 30 minutes ago and I'm answering it now. Um, if you stop, could it exacerbate the symptoms? Yeah, so colchicine is great for inflammation. I tried using it. I most people didn't benefit for long COVID vaccine injury who took it from me. I tried using it for probably a month or two, and uh, based on the recommendation of a doctor in India who had had great success with it. Um, so you know, ten percent of people will have some you know limiting gastrointestinal side effects, at least ten percent, if not more. And it seemed like it was more than that for me, but at least ten percent just won't be able to use it because it just affects their stomach too much. Um, it's great for treating myocarditis, pericarditis. It's great for long COVID and people who can tolerate it. Apparently, you know, I just never really got going with it because I didn't get great feedback from it. Um, and I don't know, it's possible that if you stop anything that's working really well, there could be a rebound of symptoms. Um, at least if you don't continue taking it until the thing is completely eradicated. Uh, yeah, ivermectin is great. Symptoms do tend to come back sometimes. I think ivermectin is great because it's so much more, it's so much 
better tolerated than colgestine. I mean, it's way better tolerated. You can use much higher doses with no side effects or minimal side effects. If you get some effects, you can spread out the dose um, for and get the same beneficial effect without the side effects in most cases. Um, and if it's the symptoms are coming back after ivermectin, they're probably going to come back after colchicine. And it just means you didn't use it long enough. Did you use it for a month, two months? Maybe you needed to use it for three months, six months, nine months, you know? Um, maybe you need to do other things uh, to really help your body completely fully reset. Maybe you didn't, like you didn't completely eliminate the spike and the iron and the microclots and all that stuff. And, and it was just covering up the problem instead of completely getting rid of it. So you have to use other things with it, like low dose naltrexone. Maybe you might have to use uh, the microclot approaches and the plasma donation and um, all optimize your diet and your nutrition and may might need to do an elimination diet. I mean, too few people actually utilize the elimination diet. It's very helpful for healing. Um, all right, so this is Jeff Thompson's uh, website, scientificsounds.com. Sounds like a cool website for healing music. Um, yeah, well, smart meter, you got it. <laughs> Somebody was trying to help me out there 30 minutes, 25 minutes ago when I was searching for the word. Uh, what kind of overlaid height, light in the office is best? Um, probably an incandescent would be the best aside from sunlight itself. Um, I would prefer sunlight if at all possible, but yeah, overhead light you're talking about, okay, the optimal overhead light, right? While well, we're talking about best, which is probably unlikely to be available anywhere, is a sun lamp that pierces through all the floors until it reaches yours from the roof, okay? Some really modern off, you know, advanced, um, forward-thinking offices actually have these. Some of them even have them in their parking garages at the bottom. So you, it's like a, I forget, it's like a tube light or something it's called. It's like a sun tube or something. You know, there's different brands of them. But basically there's at the, at the roof or, you know, on the roof, you have a dome-like, you know, glass cover. It would be best if that were made out of quartz glass. I don't know if they are, but quartz glass would be optimal. And then you have this extremely highly reflective silver tube. You know, it's lined by this extremely highly reflective material that goes down until it reaches the ceiling. And then there's another, um, you know, um, piece of glass that just looks like a, a lamp, right? Um, uh, another um, dome shaped piece of glass on the ceiling. And so it's like this silver reflective tube connected with a dome-shaped glass on the top and dome-shaped glass on the bottom. And sunlight hits from any angle, enters that tube and bounces back and forth and then shines out at the bottom. Those are optimal. Those, especially if they were, if they had quartz glass cover on top and quartz glass on the bottom, that would be optimal, right? If you didn't have a window, that would be the best overhead light. Uh, short of that, <laughs> It's going to be probably incandescent. Uh, all right. Everyone was talking about Better Call Saul at this point. Um, and then The Invisible Rainbow. That's one of the one of the books that you can read about uh, EMFs. Um, Didier Rao is a great guy and another good doctor in France, harassed by the government. He used the Lenko's protocol. Um, all right. Uh, can't get your supplement always out. Tried to call, no answer. Was pre. I, I don't know. I mean, all, all of our supplements are always available except the detox, which is out, which has been out for probably a few weeks now. We're, you know, it's going to come back. All the rest should be in stock, and they've never been out of stock. But the detox supplement is going to be back up and you know new and improved with the bromelain, um, based on the McCullough base spike detox protocol. Um, hopefully in the next week, two weeks, three weeks. I don't know. These things are hard to predict. But we are going to get it back. And once it comes back, it probably won't go out of stock again because the reason it went out of stock was because the augmented NAC wasn't in stock for months. Um, and then once it came back into stock, they wouldn't allow us to use it in the supplement anymore. So they, uh, they refused to let us use augmented NAC. You can only buy their augmented NAC in their bottle and resell it to people. So unfortunately, you can't put augmented NAC in a and another supplement. So that's why we had to take it out. And I think it was a good thing because we could replace it with bromelain, um, which is part of Pancala's base spike detox, as I said.
So it's probably more important than the NAC anyway. Um, and, and like I said, we'll, you will probably will be able to decrease the cost of the detox supplement when it comes back, and then you can add regular NAC, which will probably still be cheaper than way cheaper. It will for sure be way cheaper to get the detox plus the regular NAC supplement, you know, together to get all the benefits. And you just have to take a couple extra pills of regular NAC to get the same effect as you would from a lower dose of augmented NAC. All right. Um, lots of therapy is expensive. Understand protocol Mount Sinai is gold, but can't go only for, I don't know, see Dr. Sabina Zahn, California, share gut info, has a book. Uh, this is a very hard to understand uh, post. Um, yeah, she, her book is something SH upside down exclamation point T. Uh, let's talk. S H I T is her book. Um, all right. Uh, Purity coffee. Yeah, I think that's the one. You're right. <laughs> you know, this is the power of the internet and, um, you know, the interconnected brain. <laughs> if somebody always knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, when you can't remember the name of something. All right. The other people are saying bulletproof coffee, perfect coffee, Dr. Living Good coffee are all mold free and tested. My nut pods creamer is my favorite. Um, Uh, Andrew or Julianne Nugent Head. I don't know what about Gibson and Spend Love, but uh, Andrew or Julianne Nugent Head. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Are you, is Steve talking about psoriasis, using chlorine dioxide for psoriasis um, as a mild topical treatment? Um, sounds interesting. Uh, yeah, this is the Chinese acupuncture clinic um, staff. That's uh, Sissima JB's clinic. Um, her doctor wanted to do plastic surgery, we opted out, and chlorine dioxide did the trick. I maybe you mentioned something earlier, but I can't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I haven't look deep into chlorine dioxide but i think that you know obviously a lot of people talk about it it's like there's things online i tried to order a book i think about it but it hasn't gotten to me yet so i would like to learn more about it um seems like if you know how to use it it may be helpful um but i don't know about it um i th yeah we already talked about this so maybe i'm it was reposted uh, oh, here's Spangnam Moss products. Awesome. CWSnaturally.com. Um, thank you. Uh, my husband's diagnosed with diffuse dural enhancement, tested, testing for almost two years to find the cause. All tests are negative. Now thinking it was caused by COVID-19. Um, so the dura is the covering of the brain and... Um, Enhancement might indicate some sort of inflammation there, but uh, yeah, I haven't had anyone who had that. And I mean, I assume he has some symptoms from it, uh, but yeah. Um, so I, I don't have specific experience with this, but I don't think it's really necessary. I think that you have to think of these things in terms of underlying cause, root cause analysis, which is spike protein toxicity and that may specific, probably specifically relates to vascular inflammation, vascular damage. And the way to fix that is with oxygen therapy, like hyperbaric oxygen, which triggers stem cell production, as well as getting rid of the spike. Um, and the specific manifestation of these root causes will vary person to person. So your husband has drill enhancement, most people don't, but the underlying cause uh, was COVID-19 and probably entered the bloodstream, transfected cells in the brain or the blood vessels in the brain in that region and caused this particular problem. And in order to heal it, you have to think from that initial root cause. Have you heard of anyone having a torn retina? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe one or two people. I feel like I've heard it before, but it was probably just maybe one person and maybe not. I don't remember very well. Uh, can that be healed if they still have no eyesight a year later and they put silicone in the eye to keep the retina on? Yeah, um, I don't have experience with this. I, my 
baseline is that anything can be healed, but some things might be very, very tricky to heal, right? So I don't know if we have the technology to heal a torn retina, um, but it's certainly possible. I mean, I think eventually we'll have the technology to do it, and there may be some way to do it through, um, you know, visualization and qigong and you know Chinese medicine and acupuncture or something um, by directing your own ability to heal to that area. And you know, the way the visualization works for healing is you have to study that area that you're trying to fix so that you can clearly visualize what's actually happening as much as possible, right? So you learn the anatomy of the area and you learn how it might be, like, how could that be fixed, right? You have to ask yourself, how could this be fixed, right? What would happen for this to be fixed? What cells would have to show up? What do those cells look like? What do those cells look like? What do they, those cells do? And imagine the as clearly as you possibly can, and this takes some effort and might take some time to learn how to do even, um, it might take some study, but uh, <laughs> I made it through the questions. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but it, I think there is a way, there's always a way, but I don't know what the exact way is here. Um, let me go back real quick to the saved questions. There's like a bunch of them and I'm gonna try to get through some of those. Um, Tracy said at some point in the last week, <laughs> two years out, I was feeling better and started with numbness, leg weakness, brain fog. Is it possible this is long COVID or something else? And sorry, let me just make sure my schedule is clear. Yeah, my schedule is clear. So this is going to be a monster one, guys. I don't know how long you guys can stay with me, but I'm going to try to do it. Um, I was feeling better, and maybe some of these are going to be shorter <laughs> than normal. Uh, two years out, I was feeling better. started with numbness, leg weakness, brain fog. Is it possible this is long COVID? It's possible for sure. Um, yeah, so I don't know. So the question is, is it long COVID? Is it not long COVID? It's hard to answer without more data. Um, so it could be that you became prone to this thing after COVID, but you just hadn't tipped the balance into developing the illness until a couple of years later um, due to poor lifestyle choices, stress, whatever, right? You, finally, nutrient levels dropping enough that your body doesn't have the building blocks to stave it off. Um, energy production gradually diminishing over time maybe there was ongoing inflammation maybe you had ongoing like hidden long COVID this whole time and then finally it's manifesting so it's hard to say i mean how do you know whether it's related to covid you check spike antibody level it's like a 15 dollars test at lab core you check microclot test that's like a 500 hundred dollar test at jordan vaughn's lab you check what you can order it at my go-to doc you check um the Intel DX test, $450 test. Um, they have two of them. Each are about $450. You check that and see if you have the typical kind of like appearance, uh, the the fingerprint in your inflammatory markers of spike protein with the incel kind panel. And then in the, the other test that they do, do you have spike inside the S1 the S1 subunit of spike in the you know the macro activated macrophages is that present? These are all kind of like they help to point in the direction of hey it's probably long COVID or vaccine injury. So that's how you would figure that out. And um, you know if you're wondering, at least start with the spike antibody level. It's not perfect, but if it's really really high, then it's more likely. Uh, I think the single best test if you're just going to choose one might be the microclot test because the incel kind panel. Um, it's usually going to show the positive um, for, so maybe, so it's a toss up between incel kind panel and the microclot test, um, which one is the best. So in people with actual symptoms, like in this case, I've never seen the microclot test negative in when I suspected long COVID. Um, so I think that's a great one. Incel DX panel, I don't know what their sensitivity specificity is um, for long COVID diagnosis. And I don't know how you would tell because there's no gold standard test for long COVID, right? So it's, it's kind of hard when you don't have a gold standard in place. Um, yeah, I don't know how we would get a gold standard even. I mean, and so the X might consider their test to be the gold standard for all I know. Uh, so yeah, they, but the Incel DX test, I, I have also never seen somebody with clear long COVID that was untreated who had a negative Incel DX test. So, I, you know, maybe they're, it's a toss up. 
they're they're both pretty good. Where the Intel DX test doesn't seem super helpful is in tracking changes over time because sometimes it looks worse, sometimes it looks better, and it doesn't seem to track with symptoms. Whereas the microclot test may be better at tracking with symptoms. Um, and you do see more of a trend in a certain direction with the microclot test instead of this like up and down, like sometimes worse, sometimes better, sometimes worse, you know, and you're like, does this make any sense at all? Whereas the microclot test starts high and goes lower the longer you treat. Um, all right, so Barbara says, still having chest pain, heaviness, feeling after 25 months, what will help this? Um, you know, Buteco breathing might help. The oxygen concentrator could help. I would definitely get the oxygen concentrator and dedicate at least the next four months to using it for an hour twice a day at uh, the 100% oxygen level. And then reassess. Um, but Buteco breathing, absolutely. I actually, I think, yeah. Um, and mind body medicine will definitely help with chest pain and heaviness after 25 months. It's just a matter of doing it. So ch check out Andy Bayless. He's very reasonably priced. Um, TMSPainRelief.com is his website. And he has limited, very limited availability, but I know he does have you know, some availability. And there's uh, a page on that site where you can reach out to him. Again, like of the mind body practitioners, he's like the cheapest one I can think of. So if you got to start someplace, start there. Otherwise, you can try the Curable app. Um, they specifically deal with chronic pain that people can't get rid of. And uh, if you go through that app, it's probably may even be cheaper than Andy Bayless. Um, and he'll probably recommend the app anyway. So check out the Curable app and it helps. It's tremendously effective. You just got to believe it can work, right? That's the main thing. It, mind body medicine works. Your mind controls every single thing in your body. It's just a matter of learning how to um, affect all those things in your body. So you can switch off pain, you know, like people in the past literally learned how to make their limbs numb, you know, so that they could undergo major surgery without feeling any pain. It sounds like it should take three years of living in Tibet, studying a monk to learn that, and yet it doesn't, okay? It just takes a couple of months of, I mean, maybe it takes 30 years to learn how to you know, undergo major surgery, but it doesn't take 30 years to get rid of something like chest pain that you've had for a couple of years. That can be gotten rid of in a few months of doing something like the Curable app or talking to somebody who practices mind-body medicine. So it's not as hard, and it certainly doesn't take as long as learning how to you know, levitate in the you know, Hindu Kush. Um, Kathy says, do diet drinks affect long COVID? Uh, they might. I mean, anything, any kind of like toxic chemical substance, like this junk that's found in diet drinks, um, can affect people who are uh, sensitive to that substance. So I don't think that non-caloric sweeteners are helpful at all because what they do is they increase your caloric intake later. So even though you're not getting the calories while you're drinking the drink, it increases your appetite for calories later and you end up eating the same amount of calories. So people don't actually benefit from them. So if you want to drink a soda drink, just drink a soda drink with sugar in it. Okay. Forget it. Drop the diet stuff. Okay. Forget about the, you know, all these toxic chemicals that they put in diet drinks, even if they end up putting allulose or some other quote unquote non-caloric sweetener, you know, it doesn't matter. You're, you're, you're missing the point, right? You're, this thing is extremely highly processed, right? Even the natural sugars like allulose or xylitol or whatever. Um, and all that processing probably includes dozens or if not hundreds of toxic chemicals, which all leave trace amounts in the final end product and which go into your body. Um, and you don't even benefit by losing weight anyway because you end up eating the you know, more calories later because it triggers your um, appetite to eat more later because your body's like, sweet is supposed to come with calories. Where are the calories? Let's find them. Let's find them later. You know, the next time you eat, we're going to get those calories. So that plus just the toxic chemical issue, um, plus the phosphate, the inorganic phosphate issue, which is hugely important and no one knows about. And it's in basically all processed food, but very highly concentrated in soft drinks and doesn't have to be mentioned on the label, toxic to your kidneys, not good for anything. Um, so avoid inorganic phosphate. Don't drink diet drinks. Uh, Jermaine says, I had COVID in 2021. I'm not vaccinated. The only remaining issue is psoriasis that was aggravated. Um, maybe this person, I think this person showed up in the live stream and we already answered the question. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you basically pasted the live stream question in here. Um, so we've already answered this. Uh, a husband has had COVID, Bridget says, for two years. He's always fatigued and his feet are numb. Um, sunlight, infrared therapy, very helpful for fatigue. Um, Evermectin LDN, very helpful for fatigue. Uh, elimination diet can be very helpful. Low, cal low uh, carb diets can be helpful um, to recover from that. S obviously sleeping properly, which means fixing the circadian rhythms. Uh, for the feet numbness, specifically if you want some sort of like specific neuro protocol, then check out Dr. Graf's protocols on his Substack. Um, and, uh, and also you probably need to double check that you're not deficient in B12, other B vitamins um, and other things like the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A and stuff like that to make sure that you don't have neurological um, issues due to just nutrient deficiencies. And then obviously do the, do, do the comprehensive protocol. You know, I'm hitting some highlights here, but really it should be comprehensive and cover all the detox stuff for spike protein and and include the plasma donation. Debbie says, uh, if someone had COVID and suspected shedding, but no jabs, do we need to do anything to protect ourselves? Uh, so shedding, if you're not um, affected, so if you are suspecting that you're being shed upon, you could check your spike antibody level and track it over time. Again, it's like a $15 test at LabCorp, um, or at least when we order it, it's $15. Um, I mean, we, we don't, offer it for $15 because we have to or have like a physician ordering fee in included, but the test itself costs $15 um, with a physician account. It's probably, it might be like $30 if you had to go direct. But um, so anyway, you could probably find it at most places, like any, any lab test now you can, you know, LabCorp, I think even Quest have like a order your own test option. And so, so it's probably in the $15, $30 range. Um, and so if it, start spiking after a suspected shedding exposure, then you probably were shed upon because, you know, you got exposed to spike and your body reacted to it, created antibodies. Um, it's unclear whether you have to do something to protect yourself long term. Um, so I don't really know the answer. Probably the best article that's been written so far is by a Midwestern doc dot substack dot com. So a Midwestern doc doc, I think, dot substack.com and check out one of his latest articles in the last month. Pierre Corey retweeted it out one or two times, actually. Um, so Pierre Corey often retweets uh, Midwestern Doc's Substack articles whenever there's something interesting. So you can check his Twitter feed for that retweet. And um, I probably retweeted it as well. But uh, yeah, he goes into all, everything we know about shedding. So definitely check that out. Uh, Dia says, with regard to long COVID and following Dr. Heider's protocol. What, what what are the best exercises for leg weakness when walking is still a challenge? Um, so if you're having leg weakness, then I would start off with mobility exercises on the ground where you're doing stretching, stretching all the leg muscles, um, and uh, working on joint mobility in the lower legs and working on your posterior chain, making sure it's all flexible and everything. Um, and then maybe check out uh, qigong walking or chi walking, I think it might be called. Um, they kind of describe, uh, you know, tr trying to optimize the biomechanics of walking and they kind of describe it as kind of falling forward and catching yourself rather than staying rigidly upright and trying to walk forward um, mechanically like that. Uh, and maybe consider getting a pair of, uh, doing a lot of grounding, get a grounding mat at uh, for your bed, or sorry, grounding mat for wherever you sit during the day and a grounded bed sheet for your bedroom with a grounded uh, pillow cover from groundlux.com, G-R-O-U-N-D-L-U-X-E.com. Uh, and you can look into grounded shoes as well and uh, try walking in a natural environment like the forest where there's a lot of anti-inflammatory um, immune boosting uh, scent compounds on the air and uh, see if you can wear grounded walking shoes when you walk in the forest. Uh, and... Other than that, uh, get a lot of sunlight and get some phototherapy on your legs. Um, you can try this. Um, it oftentimes helps a lot is to, you can put castor oil and even turmeric mixed with castor oil, although that's really, really messy. You gotta be careful on your legs um, and then expose them to the sun. And uh, that may be, the castor oil is a very healing oil for some reason. Um, is, two, is there anything on the long COVID protocol I should avoid while on Zerelto for clots in the popliteal vein? 
Uh, the other thing I would recommend is like a sauna every day, right? Uh, 30 minutes of sauna every day. And, and take ch check out you know, you know a cold plunge that, that might be helpful as well. I haven't talked about it in a long time, but that was really instrumental in helping me just get rid of the final vestiges and bits of long COVID. Uh, is there anything on the long COVID protocol I should avoid while on Xarelto for clots in the popliteal vein? Uh, with, when you're on Xarelto, you need to be careful about natokinase, seropeptase, um, even like some of the herbs. They, they all have blood thinning effects, not, not very strong, but uh, you know it, it may be possible to use them, and um, but it may be harmful uh, in some people, depending on how much anticoagulation is going on. So Xarelto is pretty strong, but some people, they check their microclots on Xarelto and they still have microclots and they have to add aspirin and Plavix and natokinase and serpeptase before they start going away. Um, plasma donation would help get rid, of the, get rid of that without adding blood thinners. So if anyone's worried about, okay, I might be too much, I might have too much anticoagulation going on in my body, then the solution is plasma donation because it doesn't require anticoagulation, but it accomplishes what you need to accomplish. Although three, although my brain and spine MRIs with contrast are normal, my neuro neurologist, I suppose, tells me my issue cannot be related to a COVID vax accident because my symptoms began within 48 hours and that's too soon. That is not too soon. It can, they can begin within minutes. This guy doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. Uh, no disrespect. But uh, have you heard of this? Yes. Just check out the bolus theory from Mark Girardeau. Uh, it's uh, covidmythbuster.substack.com. It's probably one of the pin posts, but the, the bolus theory explains why the reaction can happen, happen instantly. It can kill you right away. It can happen within minutes, hours, days. You know, it, it can happen after a period of time, but definitely within 48 hours is very, very possible. This guy doesn't understand what the mechanism is of the injury. Uh, in your experience with your pa other patients, is there a decent probability my gait might, have re might return to pre-vax accident? levels or will I continue to shuffle forever? No, you can absolutely cure this or heal this, um, however you want to look at it. It's just might be difficult, might require a lot of effort, might require doing things that you don't want to do. It might require mind-body medicine, for example. It might require elimination diets. It might require some expense, perhaps. I think things can be done without a lot of expense, but then you have to really double down on things that most people just don't want to do, like learn mind-body medicine you know, and learn how to um, visualize and learn gratitude and, you know, completely overhaul your diet and lifestyle, you know, go really deep on the things that you can't afford to do instead of the things that you can't afford to do. Plasma donation, I think everyone can afford because it's not only free, it, it's better than free, they pay you for it. So um, my internist is pushing a rheumatologist for the consult, all 89 labs have returned normal. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it'll hurt, but it might. The, the, the reason that it might hurt to see another doctor is because they're very, very discouraging and they tend to curse you with their words. Like, oh, you're just going to have to put up with it. You're just going to have to learn to live with it. I can't find anything wrong with you. Um, you know, the, the worst is when they find something wrong and tell and give you the curse, which is like, you're just going to learn have to learn to live with it. You're going to have this forever. It'll never get better, blah, blah, blah. It's probably less bad when they can't figure out what's wrong, but... In any case, they just don't know how to communicate and they can insert these things into your subconscious mind, especially if you trust them. They can be very, very powerful nocebos. So you, you would expect to get a placebo, if anything, from a doctor, but you usually get a nocebo. So I hesitate to go see any doctor because I've never seen anyone who knows how to speak without cursing people, uh, giving them these, what, um, you know, this one physician that I interviewed called curses, and that's how he describes them in this book, Healing Beyond Pills and Potions. Um, well worth a read. And for most people, once they get through that entire book, they can kind of like figure out the mind-body medicine piece themselves. So they can figure out how to do it themselves and uh, figure out what, what might need to be fixed uh, internally. Um, so again, you know, if you want a specific neuro supplement protocol, check out Dr. Grouse protocol. And, uh, you know, for the VAX injury, just come to me, comprehensive injury protocol. I would highly recommend the elimination diet of some kind, AIP or carnivore perhaps, um, along with uh, ivermectin, LDN, and all the supplements and all the lifestyle stuff, the sunlight and the spending as much time as possible outside and sleeping on a grounded bed sheet. And, um, 
oxygen concentrator therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, if you can get it, high dose IV vitamin C, if you can find it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole protocol. It's, you know, I feel like I have to repeat the same protocol for every question, but I don't because you can just go check out my doc.com, scroll to the bottom. There's a bunch of protocols and it's on there. Um, one of those protocols in there, long COVID vaccine injury, injury protocol. Lillian Pinchock says, I'm a long hauler since March of 2020. All right, we got two more questions. If you guys can stick with me for another five to 10 minutes, we're going to get this done. <laughs> and then I'm going to go back and see if there's any new live stream questions. Uh, I'm a long hauler since March of 2020. I was heavy when I first got sick, gained about 30 pounds the first year, and then lost over 100 pounds due to gast gastroparesis and other GI issues the second and third year. Suddenly, two months ago, I started gaining weight for no... So I hope you didn't take one of those like sex senda or something like that, because that causes gastroparesis too. Um, suddenly, two months ago, I started gaining weight for no apparent reason. I gained 40 pounds in two months no diet or medication changes. How can I stop this from continuing to happen? I was right where I should have been weight-wise when I lost the initial weight. Please advise. Um, so it could be so many different things. It could be cortisol-related, stress-related, poor sleep-related, thyroid-related, um, gut bacteria-related, um, toxin-related, you know, I don't know. Um, this, what changed two months ago, right? So if you had to guess, what was it that caused you to start gaining weight two months ago? Did somebody die? Did you lose a job? Did you get under a lot of stress? Did you stop sleeping well? I mean, only you know, right? Um, so, so it's not only diet and medication changes. Literally anything could be like a subconscious trigger for a change in your health, including weight gain or whatever. Stress is a very common cause of weight gain. People just don't, you know, imagine that it could cause such a severe, significant weight gain, but it can. Uh, lack of sleep can do the same. So, stress and lack of sleep. What does stress do? It triggers the production of cortisol in your body. And cortisol is a steroid. And I think it's pretty famous that steroids cause weight gain. So, you know, you, you, the issue is that your health is very brittle and you're not very resilient. And something probably relatively small that wouldn't have affected you earlier in your life was able to cause um, such a significant change in your in your weight very quickly. Um, possibly by pushing a bunch of those buttons like thyroid, you know, estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, you know, um, gut bacteria, et cetera, et cetera, levels. Um, so what the aim is to uh, optimize your health and become resilient again. That takes time. It takes a year or two. You, you have to first get rid of all your problems. And then you have to keep going, optimizing, optimizing, getting rid of visceral fat optimally checking an abdominal MRI or DEXA scan to make sure that the visceral fat is dwindling over time until it's finally gone or almost gone. Um, and your blood sugar and your fasting insulin is optimal and your metabolism is running perfectly. And then you start doing these like stress test days, which I would prefer calling them other than rather than cheat days. You're, you're purposely stressing your body, like try traveling around the world. Do you still, do you bounce back really quickly? after losing a lot of sleep, try eating a bunch of junk food one day. Do you bounce back really fast the next day? Or does it take you a week? Are you ruined for a week or whatever, right? So that's the final stage. You're, you're feeling fantastic. All the biomarkers, everything is perfect, running perfectly. And then you start to do these stress tests to see how resilient am I actually, right? Can I go partying all night? You know, can I go and, you know, have a birthday party where I actually eat ice cream and junk food and stuff and just like, give it a break. I mean, you don't do this every day, but you maybe you do it once a month, maybe you do it twice a month, but you have this picked out beforehand. I'm going to run this stress test. You plan it, you plan a recovery phase afterwards and you, and you see what happens. Um, so that's, that's how you get truly healthy. Julie Shigeno says, what kind of tests are available that are more comprehensive that could be helpful in treating long COVID? Uh, what additional tests can our med doc, medical doctor give us who are either reluctant or uninformed. So we have a, a whole website for this. Um, I think it's labs. No, it's labs. Maybe it's labs.mygotodoc.com, where we list all these tests. And I have a Substack article on some of these tests. Uh, yeah, so go to labs.mygotodoc.com, click all labs, and um, yeah, there's a comprehensive screening panel, Cyrex. Master John Comprehensive Nutritional Panel, the Master John Schilling Advanced Spike 
toxicity panel, the microlot test, Sabine Hazam's microbiome. The comprehensive screening panel, um, so the prices here are not for the prices of the tests except for the microclot test. The prices here are the costs of us ordering all of the tests and you don't necessarily have to do all the tests that are recommended. Um, but if you click read more on the comprehensive screening panel, it'll open up and it includes like CBC, CMP, you know, all the normal stuff, EKG, echo, chest x-ray. Um, and then it goes into things like uh, the incel, we, we can order the incel DX panel for you. We can order the immune subset panel from incel DX, a gallery cancer screening panel, um, which checks for 50 different cancers in a, in a single blood test, the spike antibody test, which I've mentioned a few times today, a basic lymphocyte um, uh, immunophenotype panel, or a more advanced one from Cyrex Labs can be swapped in here. You know, we can order that instead. Uh, we can, and actually, we, we need to fix this website because it doesn't include everything that's included. So. In this comprehensive panel, we also will order Sabine Hazan's microbiome test if you want. We'll order uh, the high sensitive, sensitive CRP, troponin, ProBNP, and there may be a few others. I mean, we have to go back. Um, I, I know I just told everyone to go here and look, but it doesn't seem to be comprehensive. Like all the stuff that we offer in there is not included. Um, and then the Mastertron comprehensive nutritional screening is more of like a generic comprehensive nutritional workup, which is helpful for a lot of people. But the Mastertron shilling panel are specific tests that we look for in spike protein uh, diseases. Um, so yeah, on this website, I see that the Styrex lymphocyte map is listed separately. It's It doesn't necessarily have to be separate. It's actually can be ordered as part of the comprehensive screening panel. Um, the Mastertron shilling advanced spike panel, I think if you click read more, you'll see it includes there's some overlap with the first one but uh there's a lot of things that are separate like uh the ana profile amino acid profile um vitamins a b b complex c and d levels multiple hormone levels multiple mineral levels several tests for viruses like ebv cmv etc cetera, etc cetera. um zinc copper iron you know a bunch of key micronutrients uh that are can be off selenium for example um let's see galactin 3 omega uh, omega levels so omega 6 to 3 ratios um let's see uh lactic acid in this in the plasma cortisol level you know these are some hormones homocysteine um we check for herpes simplex uh, like i said earlier cmv um checking for histamine levels tryptase um immunoglobulin levels, uh, we check for Lyme disease, um, a bunch of tests for like brain, um, blood brain barrier uh, dysfunction, like neuron specific enolase, um, some clotting tests like alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, some things for gut barrier dysfunction like zonulin levels, um, <clears throat> oxidized LDLs. I mean, there's just like a lot, right? Um, mitochondrial antibody levels, a bunch of other antibody levels that are available, uh, whatever kind of specific targeted antibody levels are available that are often seen elevated in spike issues. Uh, so th those can run into the thousands of dollars um, because most of them are not covered by uh, insurance. Um, all right, so just one last sweep through here. Um, to just mention what is in the live stream. Um, I hope you and Dr. Brownstein connect. I haven't talked to them, but watch his videos before they were pulled down. He used high doses of vitamin A for four days or so, not beta carotene. Vitamin D, 50,000 IU for a few days. Yeah, it's important for a lot of people because like, a significant, maybe most people can't, maybe at least 50%, I don't remember exactly the numbers, but uh, a lot of people can't fully metabolize beta carotene to retinol, which is the active form of vitamin A. So for a supplement, it's best to just take uh, one with retinol in it. Um, Barbara says, thank you for answering. You're welcome. Uh, having a great doctor like you, uh, it's good for the mind. You were such a comfort during my acute COVID. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, this is uh, doc, substack.com forward slash at Dr. Grauf. Um, and then this is a Midwestern doctor. What is the current evidence for? And I think this is shedding. This is his shedding post. Uh, this is the groundlux.com post. Thank you um, for posting them. Um, 
I researched shingles vaccine today and didn't like what I read. I think I'll do preventive treatment with lysine and CM60, no shingles. Yeah, I would avoid shingles. Um, you, know, you can see some of the stuff uh, that health um, that um, health defense, um, children's health defense has put up on shingrix and other things. But yeah, um, I mean, I've just seen a lot of patients who get the shingles shot and then they get shingles. Um, it's, it's similar to maybe not as many, but it's a similar experience when you're working in a hospital, like, oh, I got the shingle shot, now I have shingles, as, oh, I got the pneumonia shot this year, finally, after years of not getting it, now I got pneumonia, ha, 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 you know, what are the odds? Apparently, the odds are pretty good, so I, I yeah, I wouldn't do it. I told my mom not to get it. Um, I, I don't like the idea. So where's a safe place for plasma donation? So uh, there are companies that do, pla that offer plasma donation it's like a an industry they take the plasma they turn it into a product and then they sell it so that's why they actually pay you for the plasma so you just have to search google maps or google for plasma donation center nearby and um i don't I, i'm sure like in a country like the united states the the quality of all these places is going to be up to a certain part right they're going to be up to a certain level so i don't think you need to really concern yourself with is this a good place or not i mean they're all going to have the same you know I assume appropriate level of precautions and everything like that, um, cleaning their equipment and everything. So um, I, I don't know a way to um, stratify them any any better than just are they licensed to you know take plasma and process it in the United States. If you're talking about another country, then you might need to do a little bit more due due diligence. But unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for this how to do due diligence. Um, so yeah, it's Dr. Grouf D O C T O R G R O U F dot Substack dot com. I think that's the best way probably to find his um, uh, all of his posts. Uh, I love what you say about doctors cursing because placebo effect, positive motivation is very important. It's of the utmost importance. That's what people don't realize. Um, it can be the most important thing in your healing can be a placebo effect. And we denigrate it to such a great degree that it's really ridiculous. You know, um, maybe we shouldn't call it the placebo effect. Maybe we should call it the belief effect or, you know, the spiritual, you know, effect or the mental effect or whatever but it is oftentimes the strongest effect acting on people when they take a medication it's far stronger in its effect than most medications that we prescribe so the vast majority of the effect of like all the almost all the psychiatric drugs is the placebo effect that's their primary effect and then if there's any other effect beyond the placebo effect, it's minuscule, it's like tiny. And oftentimes, I mean, like in the studies on depression, when they looked at all the studies, you know, they unboxed all the stuff that pharma didn't want to publish, et cetera. Um, they found that the clinical significance of the effect beyond the placebo effect was so small that it wasn't, it wasn't even clinically detectable. Like you couldn't even clinically, like if you would, you know, if you tried to detect it with like, like it was detectable on a scale, right? Like uh, this, this, but the the change was so minute that you wouldn't have noticed it in the real world. Like if you knew the person, the the difference between them on and off wouldn't have been enough for somebody to actually recognize, and maybe not even enough for the patients to recognize. So it's it's the effect of some of these drugs is essentially the placebo effect. There's a great book also called um, Surgery, I think, is the ultimate placebo, maybe is the name of the book, something along those lines. And uh, I mean, he argues that, I mean, the reason surgery is such a good placebo, but, but he gives all these examples of surgeries which are either proven to be placebos or are very likely only placebos and not, not actually doing anything beyond the placebo effect. But it's hard to get such a strong placebo effect without jumping through all the hoops and actually going under the knife and actually having a surgery. Like, and unfortunately they don't let you do a real placebo surgery, right? I mean, to get the the greatest effect, you'd have to actually trick the patient into thinking that they were actually getting a surgery. Now there is a placebo effect, even when the patient knows that they're getting a placebo supposedly. I mean, I wonder, you know, given the the rate of literacy in the world today, whether people people just didn't understand. But there was a Harvard study apparently that found that people could be told you're getting a sugar pill and they would still get better, even though they knew it was nothing other than sugar pill, quote unquote, placebo. Regardless, um, surgery, you know, you, there's studies and papers on how to 
maximize the placebo effect, which is really important, I think, for doctors to know, and yet no one knows. So the more complicated the procedure, the more expensive the procedure, the more um, the person who's doing it is like, you know, well trusted or like has like the accoutrement of like, you know, being a big shot, you know, he has all the things on his wall and he's like the head of the department and, you know, he's somebody who's the top in their field on whatever, you know, they're going to be more likely to trigger it or be able to trigger it. Um, the more complex, intricate, expensive, difficult, hard, painful, all these things can add to the effect. And so that's why surgery is oftentimes very powerful as a placebo, because you have to have a pre-op procedure and you have to see all these specialists and you have to get like screened and then you have to go and talk to the anesthesiologist and you have to schedule a certain time and it's quite expensive. And then you have to get anesthesia and then you have to, you know, and then you wake up and you've got a scar and there's some recovery time and it's inflamed and it hurts and you have to take other medications and then you have to have post-op stuff and you have to go meet the surgeon again. And this whole gigantic thing, just by, you know, by it's being so big and convoluted and, you know, impressive seeming to us, to our subconscious, imparts a tremendous placebo effect on it. So, um, you know, I think physicians throughout time, even today, use placebos uh, in daily practice. Um, you know, sometimes they know or they're, they're told that like, yeah, Zithromax isn't going to work for this because it's a viral, but they're going to prescribe it anyway because the patient thinks it's going to work and, and then it does work. In, in other countries, oftentimes people who are less well-informed, uh, less literate, et cetera, doctors will prescribe like supplements and like vitamins and stuff, but they're like prescription versions, right? And, and the person's like, oh, wow, I got like these five, you know, amazing medications from the doctor and you know they I, i'm gonna get better now um and and part of the reason they get better is placebo or belief um all right so uh dr axe has a post dr axe has a lot of good posts he has a post on the aip diet uh chris Kreister also has some great stuff um all right, I read current shingle, yeah, uh, Vax is mRNA, which I personally want to avoid. Um, they're gonna tell you once mRNA ends up in the shots is my, I mean, belief. I, I don't think that they're gonna stick shots in, or mRNA and things without really making it known. I, I'm not aware of any uh, current mRNA vaccine vaccines out there other than the COVID shots. I know that they're in development and the flu shot is in development at mRNA version, but it wasn't available this year. Um, after COVID, my husband was severely clotted and had open heart surgery, but still has a lot of clotting in his legs. What besides exercise, um, which he's doing, can he do? Uh, plasma donation um, and uh, uh, infrared therapies, um, sauna. Um, so optimizing all of his, you know, nutrition, lifestyle, everything, natokinase, seropeptase, bromelain, um, lumbrokinase possibly could be in there. But again, like I said earlier, I would start with lumbrokinase alone and then consider adding others and then track the D-dimer over time. Um, check the microclots because again, the D-dimer is not perfect if there could be microclots and the D-dimer positive is a good thing. But once the microclots are gone, then you want the D-dimer eventually to go negative and, and turn off that to mean that there's no clotting left. Uh, can you talk about things you've seen that work to resolve AFib without an interventional procedure? You might look into heart math, just anti-inflammatory diet in general. Um, an elimination diet can do it. Um, I'm trying to remember, there was something recently about AFib. I mean, obviously, optimizing thyroid health, um, there may be an issue with too much thyroid hormone, even, I think, too little, if I remember correctly. It's been a little while since I looked this up. Um, so I think even suboptimal thyroid function, which is weird, can also um, be involved in AFib, but I'd, I'd have to check again. Uh, so you're, you want to look into inflammation, vascular inflammation. Again, the oxygen therapy is kind of like a general, like it's stem cell therapy for your whole body. So try oxygen therapy with an oxygen concentrator plus or minus HBOT for four months and see if it helps with AFib. Um, uh, definitely any sort of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, like fixing it 
uh, treating chronic stress for sure can be really important. And there are probably some specific micronutrients that might be involved. Um, if I remember what it is, I'll, I'll mention it next week. But uh, I thought I'd come across something interesting about AFib. I just can't remember what it was. But those are the main things. I mean, you have to calm down the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system. And buteco breathing, I think it might have been one of those things that I was thinking of. Yeah, so, so try buteco breathing. Um, But yeah, mainly optimize everything because AFib is like everything else that's a chronic issue that there's probably dozens of little things that are feeding into it. If you fix enough of those things, and these are lifestyle factors as well as perhaps toxins, as well as perhaps micronutrient deficiencies. But if you fix enough of them, the AFib goes away. You don't have to fix all of them. You just have to fix enough of them to shift the balance, right? It's like a seesaw. There's positives and negatives. And if you eliminate enough negatives, add enough positives, you tip back into health versus disease. So that's really how all disease works. Um, but yeah, vagus nerve exercises might help. Absolutely, that's a good point. So, um, you know, there's the vagal nerve stimulator. You can do that 15 minutes a day, but uh, you know, yoga, qigong, any kind of like relaxing thing. Like I was saying earlier, five minutes a day, four or five times a day throughout the day, have like a relaxing, you know, session or whatever. Um, optimizing sleep, sun exposure can be very powerful for heart health, especially, especially. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's possible to heal this. I mean, this is a, a really, a, it's a growing problem, AFib. I mean, we just see so much of it in the hospitals and um, it's likely linked to inflammation and stress and, uh, so really the answer is similar to most things. All right, everyone, I think I made it to the end. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I think most of you stuck with me for this two and a half hours. We did it all on the public facing channels. We didn't switch over to pro.longcovereset.com, which we usually do. I think last time somebody was like, oh, I can't find you on longcovereset.com. It's for the live stream, it's pro, P-R-O dot longcovereset.com. You can't just put it in longcovereset.com. Eventually we'll merge the sites and they'll all be in one site, which will be longcovereset.com. But until then, the live streams when we do switch over are at pro.longcovereset.com. All right. Thank you, everyone. I will see you next time. Or maybe not. Maybe I did enough this time. <laughs> Skip next week. <laughs> we should just restream this next week. It was so long. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be traveling next week, so I may not make it. But uh, love to do these. Um, and we'll come back as soon as I can. All right, everyone. Peace out. Bye-bye.